Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Sunday of the month, which means it's time for Nutrition Insights with Dr. Peter Rogers. And you can see by his slide that today he's going to be talking about diabetes beyond fat and fructose. Please welcome him back to the show. How have you been, Dr. Rogers? Oh, good. Thanks. So diabetes, that's a bad one. Is it easier to prevent than it is to reverse? Oh gosh, much easier to prevent than reverse, but it's often reversible. You catch it within the first couple of years, it's routinely reversible. I can't wait to see your presentation. Thank you. Okay, well, everybody's heard of Nietzsche, Beyond Good and Evil. Today, we're going to talk about diabetes beyond fat and fructose. Okay, now a good place to get started with diabetes is the lecture here. Uh, on Chef AJ's channel with Dr. McDougall. It's an excellent, excellent lecture. And, you know, what he's going to mainly emphasize is the information that's been available for about 100 years, going back to the 1920s, um, about, you know, J. Shirley Sweeney paper. And then he goes through the big landmark papers on diabetes, Hemsworth, the work of Kempner, uh, the work of Rabinowich. Okay, and there's, a, there's several other ones with similar type of things. Okay, and you know, you get the point, you know, where, how are you going to define diabetes? You know, hemoglobin A1C over 6.5, fasting blood sugar greater than 126. And a key point, everybody should know this, excessive dietary fat causes insulin resistance and causes type 2 diabetes. Okay, that's that's an essential thing to know. Um, and the best diet, low fat, 100% vegan. Okay, so Dr. McDougall goes through a lot of good things. And Dr. McDougall's kind of like the undisputed heavyweight champion of nutrition and health world, but... Hopefully someday I'd like to catch up to him, but it's not easy because he gets to read all the time. He's retired. I'm working all day long in conventional medicine, like an assembly line wage slave. I wish there was a research foundation that would want to do this type of research. Another great way to learn about diabetes is other speakers that have been on the Chef AJ channel. And these guys actually work together, Cyrus and Bobby, Robbie. Um, they're at that Mastering Diabetes group. They got real good knowledge about diabetes. They both have, you know, type one or type 1.5 diabetes. And so they've lived it their lives and have a lot of experience teaching people about it, going over the nuance of it. Okay, this is sort of their chart for what they recommend, green light foods for diabetics. Basically your plant foods, primarily your fruits and your starches and your vegetables. Okay, um, and then they recommend, they put in the yellow light category, these high fat plant foods. Uh, this one, I wouldn't even go near it nowadays with all the, the coating on it. But um, so they, they yellow light most of those relatively high fat plant foods and they red light all the animal foods and all the oils. That's all of the oils too, and including the EVOO, olive oil. Okay, and they, and they also red light all the processed food. There's a lot of problems with processed food. Okay, then I also want to talk about some of the other perspectives on diabetes. This guy right here, Dr. Lustig, he's a pediatric endocrinologist. He's pretty famous about talking about what he believes is a dramatic increase in type two diabetes, especially in younger people, which he thinks is primarily due to increased fructose intake, especially high fructose corn syrup with uh, processed food, okay? And this other guy right here is uh, Richard Johnson. He's a nephrologist and he became interested in the subject with why does uric acid uh, seem to increase hypertension? And that led him to fructose and these guys often interview together and talk together. And there's some very interesting things about fructose and uric acid. We're gonna go over that. Um, real quick, I want you to know something about the Nauru population. Nauru is this little island. It's just north of Papua New Guinea and Australia. And the people used to be real fit and healthy. They, you know, it's a little island type place. So they grew, they had lots of sunshine. They grew their own food and they're very robust, healthy people. Um, the birds of the island though, over the years, their, their feces led to increased amount of phosphate in the soil that these corporations thought would be very profitable. So they made a deal with the people in Nauru if they could mine the phosphate out of the land, which they did. And they gave them lots of money. For a while, Nauru was the richest country in the world per capita. But here's the catch. They then had to ship in all the food because all their land was taken up for phosphate mining. So they just ship in processed food. Processed food, of course, has a really long shelf life. And now the Nauru are the fattest people in the world. So they went from being the richest to the fattest. Gee, kind of reminds me of the United States, which used to be the richest country. Now it's becoming one of the fattest uh, places. And it reminds me like the Easter Island statues. And this is another place, Island of Rapa Nui, Easter Island. And the population is going extinct. And hopefully the people of America aren't headed for a, a similar fate. 
Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about processed food. Here's another. Chef AJ's had all these guys interview on her show. This one's Michael Moss. He wrote that book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, about why is processed food so addictive. And he talks about something called the bliss point, where these food companies are very rich. They A lot of them have a billion dollars a year in revenue. They bring all these persons from the public in, and they have them try different versions of the food. And they're titrating it to get just the right amount of fat, and salt and sugar, the right mouth texture, till they hit what's called the bliss point where they become addicted to it and they just keep wanting to have more. It's like that Lay's potato chips commercial. I bet you can't just have one, okay? Now this is gonna turn out to be very interesting. The whole story about glutamate, monosodium glutamate, manufactured free glutamate. Okay, oh, one thing I was gonna say too, what's the purpose of processed food? When you look at processed food carefully, what does it actually do to people, okay? And by the way, my nicknames include Spartan Vegan and Bad Boy of Veganism. And Plato said, no man is more hated than he who tells the truth. So I tell the truth, I've been kicked out of Facebook groups. I'll bet Chef Agee's heard a lot of people saying, oh, you shouldn't interview this guy. He criticizes soy, he criticizes F minus in the water. Well, somebody has to do it. I believe it's the truth based on my extensive study. So I'm just gonna share with you my opinion and I'm trying to help you, help you okay? Uh, first of all, these, these foods, processed foods cause increased infertility because they have tremendously high amounts of estrogenic chemicals, not to mention directly toxic chemicals to the gonads, the uh, male testicles and the female ovaries in the form of aluminum, F minus, um, and then MFG, MSG, and just excess free glutamate in general um, can have a decreasing effect on fertility, okay? The next thing is they make you stupid. F minus lowers IQ, aluminum, which is put in tap water as a clarifier. Paradoxically, a metal actually makes the water look clear. That's a neurotoxin. GP glyphosate, which sprayed on the, you know, the soy and stuff and other uh, non-organic crops. That is an excitotoxin in the brain, causes activation of the NMDA receptor and glutamate receptor. Because glycine also has to bind it. It's like a coincident detector. Uh, goitrogenic soy, anything that's goitrogenic can lower IQ. Estrogenic chemicals are often goitrogenic, at least 20% of them. And a lot of them are endo, 80% of estrogenic disrupting chemicals, EDCs, are also uh, neurotoxic. And it's actually been claimed by one author, I think it was Gil Sertolini, that they should be labeled not just endocrine, but neurologic disrupting chemicals as well. Um, high fructose corn syrup is in the past, very often advertised as a preservative. And I think that's in large part because it's often contaminated with mercury as it's you know, processed and made through chloralkali vats, okay? Um, and these foods, they make you fat and they make you sick. They increase the incidence of diabetes, of uh, fatty liver, which is really diabetes of the liver essentially. Um, and these other chemicals in here that are very common in processed foods. So I just want you to know that it's, it's not an accident all this is happening. I don't think it is, okay? That's sort of the popular thing to say, oh, it's all just an accident. I'm not so sure. Okay, I wanna mention this lady to you. She did something very interesting. Her daughter had moderate autism, you know, mutism and all the other things that go with uh, autism, not being socially engaged and whatnot. Her career was, she's a protein biochemist. And she went to some, one of these, you know, family groups and they had mentioned that they took their kids off casein and gluten and it seemed to help in some of these kids. So she did that with her daughter and she improved significantly, it wasn't cured. And so then she began to study what's the deal with glutamate and what could she maybe do to help her daughter? And as it turns out, here's the big thing I got from her work that I think is great. In the brain, more than 90% of the neurotransmitters are glutamate. And the brain doesn't really care about MSG versus MFG versus wherever the glutamate comes from. Glutamate's glutamate to the body. Okay, so what does that mean? If you have a typical protein you're gonna have a bunch of amino acids like uh, pearls on a string of a necklace, okay? And glutamate is one of 20 amino acids. So if everything was equally distributed, you would expect to have 5% of the amino acids in a protein is glutamate. But some proteins have a lot more than that. Gluten in particular, she says, was named because it has so much glutamate in this way. Okay, 25% of its amino acid residues, that would be every fourth amino acid is going to be a glutamate. Casein from milk, about 20%. Soy, about 19%. Whey protein, you know, that's often in protein powders, about 13%. So anyways, she says when you process these proteins, what you do is you break apart the individual amino acids. This is actually going to be a big deal. You're going to like this. Trust me, I'm not just going off on a tangent here. You're going to like this. 
The way it works, she says, is we have taste buds in our mouth that help us to survive. Our ancestors worried about starvation. So if they find something sweet, that's good. You should eat more of that. That might help you survive. Okay. Salt was a little scarce in our ancestors' environment, so we have a salt taste bud. But she said we also have a protein taste bud, and that's these uh, glutamic acid uh, taste buds. And, you know, glutamate just means a deprotonated glutamic acid. And she says the reason is your ancestor eats something that's high in glutamate protein, then that's going to increase survival if they can get more of that food source. So they get re reward neurotransmitters released in their brain for eating the glu glutamate. It's also called umami taste receptors. And she says they're not just in your mouth. She says they're all along your digestive tract and you're rewarded, you know, psychologically for eating these foods. So the, she said the food companies kind of figured it out. They knew that MSG tasted good and that goes way back to, you know, the mid 1900s and um, then they, they had, they had figured this out in Japan long ago that the MSG tasted good, but it's going to go way beyond that. So then the food companies, uh, started putting it in the foods. They used to put it even in the baby food, not a great idea for the baby's brain health. But the next thing was that then this guy named John Olney, a PhD scientist from the United States, he put out all this information about the neurotoxicity of MSG. Okay. And how it should be taken out of the baby food, et cetera. So then the food company started to hide it by giving it all kinds of different names. Anytime you see something in a food called extract or hydrolysis, enzyme lysis, isolated uh, protein, this or that type, she said what's happening is they're breaking apart these amino acid residues. So instead of having a chain of amino acids, you have individual amino acids right here. And this is where this term comes. MFG means manufactured free glutamate. And she says, the more you free up the individual glutamate receptors, the more they hit your taste buds as a bolus and the bigger reward feeling you get from them. So the company said, okay, we're not even, we don't even have to put these words in there. We're just going to get more free glutamate by processing the food. And that gets people to be addicted to it. Okay. So that was Catherine Reed who, who figured that out. And she wrote a lot about, oh, and here, I just thought this was a little funny. This guy, Sean Baker, he's very famous in the paleo keto community. And he says that beef jerky is carnivore crack. Okay, and so I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Let me look at the ingredients here. Okay, well, the beef, so there's your, your fat. And then there's salt. So there's your salt, you know, the Michael Moss Bliss Point concept. There's your sugar right here. And now look at your MSG. I don't think Moss talked that much about MSG. I didn't hear that in his context, but I didn't actually read his book. Okay, um, and then look at this. Now you're starting to see, anytime you see soy, you should think about MSG that's often used to make it. Nowadays, actually a lot of it, it's, it's most commonly made with corn because that's cheap. Hydrolyzed means hydrolysis. You break up the protein. So that almost always means MSG. Yeast extract, the yeast are used, I think to ferment it, and that generates more uh, free glutamate. So anything extract, that's free glutamate. She says that maltodextrin and citric acid are also terms that indicate more free glutamate. So it's all absorbed into the body as free glutamate. And glutamate is 90% of brain neurotransmitters and it's excitatory, it can be excitotoxic. And especially babies don't have a well-formed blood-brain barrier. A lot of older persons have had silent strokes as well as diabetes and hypertension causing gaps in the blood-brain barrier whereby this glutamate can get access to the brain and potentially have an excitotoxic effect. In addition, you've got some areas around the third ventricle called circumventricular organs where there never is a blood-brain barrier. They're chemosensors, you know, things like your vomiting center, the area post for example. Okay, and so on. Okay, and he's a pretty strong-looking guy. He looks like a pro football player. If I had to ever challenge him in a contest, I would challenge him to push-ups because he's like six foot five. Guys with long arms, they stink at push-ups. So I'm going to challenge him to that maybe someday. Okay, here's what insulin resistance is all about. First of all, here's normal insulin. Insulin binds the insulin receptor on a cell. Let's say skeletal muscle in this context. Because when you eat a meal, that's called prandial. Postprandial, your blood glucose, the majority of it should be going for glycogen, going to be made into glycogen in the muscle, some to be stored as glycogen in the liver, for example. But let's talk about the muscle. That's the most important thing to be aware of. And once the insulin binds a receptor, it sends a message to these vesicles in the cytoplasm that contain glucose type 4 transporters. They're called GLUT4s. And then this vesicle goes up to merge with the plasma membrane. Plasma membrane is the outer membrane of a cell. And the glucose type 4 transporters are merged into the plasma membrane. And they then form a channel that allows the glucose to come into the cell. So the glucose comes into the cell and then it gets phosphorylated and it can be sent to glycogen or it can be sent to glycolysis, okay? So that's how it normally works. And it's important that this happens. This clears the initial uh, postprandial glucose out of the blood. Okay, now one of the problems is when you eat excessive amounts of dietary fat, 
and especially saturated fat, but fat in general causes increased insulin resistance. And especially sat fat is going to block around uh, complex three and coenzyme Q. This is a mitochondria. Here's the outer mitochondrial membrane. Here's the inner mitochondrial membrane. And these are the mitochondria electron transport complexes. Here's number one, two, three, four. And then this is ATP synthase, often called complex five. And these pump protons into the intermembranous space here that establishes a gradient of protons. And then the proton gradient is harvested at ATP synthase. And when a, when a hydrogen proton and H plus means proton, it's a hydrogen uh, you know, without its electron. When that's brought back into the mitochondria, that provides energy to spin ATP synthase. And that enables a phosphate to be added to ADP, adenosine di as in two diphosphate to make adenosine tri as in tri three and ATP. Okay, so that's how most of the energy in humans is made. And so this is not a good thing that this fat is inhibiting it, this process in your skeletal muscle. Because once this is inhibited, then the glucose can't get into uh, the skeletal muscle. So here's the next picture showing that same thing. So let's say the person's eating a lot of fat, especially sat fat. It's now blocking the mitochondria and you call that an overnutrition signal. And the overnutritional signal blocks the plasma membrane from these glucose type four transporters. Because the glucose type four transporters can't get into the plasma membrane, now the glucose can't get in. That's why I show it bouncing off in the wrong direction. And this is gonna be a very important point. What you should be asking yourself psychologically is, you know, why would the human body wanna do that? What is, what's wrong? Is the human body stupid or is it maybe doing that for a good reason? Why would fat cause insulin resistance? And there's gonna be a great reason for that. I'm gonna explain it when we get to Gerald Shellman, the greatest uh, diabetes researcher in the world of, of late. Um, he's the guy's a genius. We'll, we'll get to that, but just ask yourself that question. Why would it do it? And you've heard McDougal and others say it's an adaptation. There's a good reason for it. And there is. Okay. All right. Now, some people say, well, why should I bother with all this diet stuff? I'm just going to go talk to my endocrinologist and they're an expert and they're going to know this. I can tell you something. I wanted to understand diabetes because I was studying dementia. And I kept noticing over 90% of my, my demented patients were diabetic. And so I said, why is that? I got a, you know, I read everything you could read. I read all the medical textbooks, biochemistry textbooks. Then I read the, you know, the paperback books from all the legacy experts and all that stuff. And uh, then I figured, you know, I read the research papers. The most awesome paper ever written is Michael Brown, these unifying theory of diabetes complications. So though I, then I decided to go meet with some university endocrinologists. I went and met with a couple of university endocrinologists recommended to me by other doctors and nurses and so I started asking them, what do you think of the Sweeney paper, Hemsworth paper, Rabinowitz paper, Pritikin's uh, work, Brownlee's work, et cetera. They hadn't read any of the papers, not a single one. They knew all the drugs backwards and forwards, but they didn't know anything about diet. They asked me, you know, they, they would tell their patients to avoid carbs, carbs, and they were initially going to invite me to speak to their fellows, but then they were embarrassed because I knew so much more about diabetes than them um, that they then never followed up on their invite. But what I'm trying to say is, they don't know how to cure the disease. They don't know what causes it. They don't know how to prevent it. Okay, then I went to this uh, conventional medicine. It's a real famous university. I won't say the university, but it's, it's real famous. Anybody could attend this course through that. Um, and what did they say at their, this is the big university nationwide course on obesity and a lot of information on diabetes. They say, most important, never do any fat shaming. A lot of this obesity and diabetes, it's just genetic and there's nothing the patient can do about it. Uh, they complain that not enough patients are being put on medications to treat obesity. Their best treatment is bariatric surgery and that they recommend ketogenic version of the a Mediterranean diet. There was not a single word spoken in the entire meeting about low fat vegan diet. That's insane. It's crazy. And that's what I'm trying to say. People think conventional medicine is standard accepted medicine. The reality is it is completely ignorant about nutrition, about epidemiology and about toxicology. So for diseases like this, a dietary disease, they really don't know what they're talking about. And I would ask you the question, has medicine really progressed that much since the 1700s with therapeutic phlebotomy? Because billions of dollars are spent doing research directed at drugs, 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 always trying to win the lottery with a new drug, they really don't spend much time trying to understand what causes the disease. And a standard thing to prevent a disease or cure it is know what causes it and avoid the thing that causes it. Okay, so here's a joke. What's the difference between a doctor and a lawyer? I'll let you read that punchline. Okay. All right. Then the other thing I would say is I believe you have to go back to the idea of the individual is precious because if we don't go back to that idea of the individual being precious, there's always a lot more money to be made by selling uh, pills and surgery than there ever will be by teaching a person how to be healthy, by empowering them 
And that's why I, I, I don't think there's any way around it. I've been a doctor over 30 years and I'm telling you that. And here was a quote by Martin Luther. A peasant with scripture knows more than the Pope without it. And you know, my version for vegan diet, a health coach with a low fat vegan diet can help more people than the head of Harvard Hospital without it. And it's true. I, I just heard Gerald Shulman talk. He's the best researcher in the world for diabetes. He said that we really don't have any drugs that prevent insulin resistance. Yeah, we've got one. It's called low fat vegan diet and it works fantastic. All right. He can't talk about that. I'm sure he knows the guy's a genius. I'm sure he knows, but he can't talk about it either. He won't get his grant money. Okay. Here's another real smart guy. This guy, his name is Chris Knob. He's an ophthalmologist and he became interested in studying nutrition. And he's a little bit of a meat promoter in some of his work, in my opinion. But the reason I show you, excuse me there, he went through all the epidemiology and was trying to figure out the correlates between the increase in obesity amongst Americans. And back in the 1800s, the average man weighed about 148 pounds. Now the average man weighs about 198. So 50, gained 50 pounds, you know, that's in not a lot of time. So it's not genetic, okay? So the question is, what do you think it is? Now, if you ask Lustig and Johnson, they're going to say, oh, too much fructose, especially high fructose corn syrup. But he says, no, that's not it. According to Knob, he believes the main cause is all the vegetable oils, the omega-6 cooking oils. He thinks that's the, the number one correlate. And I also would say, I see in a lot of these popular uh, lectures on the internet, excuse me, a lot of persons trying to say it's because of this or it's because of this. I call it a quest for oneism. You know, Lustig and um, Johnson, they really, really strongly emphasize fructose. And there's a lot of other famous doctors out there really, really saying it's fructose. And what I'm saying is it's a whole bunch of things. And then another big uh, question comes up. When you start talking about fructose, what about all these athletic guys who eat tons of fruits? So here's a guy named Michael Arnstein. He's a famous ultra marathoner running, you know, 50 mile races, even 100 mile races. He moved to Hawaii so he could eat more fruits. Okay, look how skinny he is. All right, and they got tons of energy. You're running 100 miles. This is not a, a fat fructose eating diabetic. This is a super fit guy. And so my point is fruit and high fructose corn syrup are two very different things. And also, you know, he's an extremely athletic guy. And here's another one of these guys. This guy rides his bicycle in competitions, uh, durian rider, okay? And he's kind of famous, famous for saying sugar is the best stimulant for your muscles and your, and your Johnson, okay? But the reason I show it to you is look at him. He's as skinny as it gets. And I've seen a lot of the people he's trained and coached. They're also pretty skinny, eating tons of fruits, all right? Uh, so how could that be? Um, here's some other really skinny people. Everybody knows Ruth Heidrich and she loves eating fruit. She initially started out mostly with the McDougal starch-based plant diet. And then she gradually, for convenience, started eating more of a raw plants diet. Um, and so did this lady here, uh, Janet Murray. She also, you know, both of these ladies had metastatic uh, breast cancer. And um, they're alive decades later. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what's the difference between glucose and fructose. Okay. When glucose comes into the liver, initially it's phosphorylated. That always happens to a sugar, so it can't go back out once it's got a big charge on it. And then it gets, it undergoes a reaction where it gets converted into fructose because fructose is a more symmetric molecule. That's going to facilitate splitting it in the second half of the cycle. But the point I wanted to make is the main job of the liver is to regulate blood glucose and to make sure the brain has enough blood glucose during fasting. That's the most important thing the liver does. So the liver is great at handling glucose. This is the glycolysis cycle to, for example, to burn glucose for energy. And the liver will not run this cycle unless it has a good reason. It's very tightly regulated. This enzyme right here is phosphofructokinase. So um, this enzyme is tightly controlled and glycolysis with glucose, it will not happen unless the liver needs it to happen. All right, now on the other hand, fructose is very different. By the way, glucose goes all over the body when you absorb it from your gut. It goes everywhere in your body, taken up by your brain, by your muscles, all over the place. Whereas fructose, almost entirely, almost all of it goes right into the liver. And when it goes into the liver, it gets phosphorylated as well. And then it enters glycolysis at the three carbon phase. Both uh, glucose and fructose are both six carbon sugars, but fructose doesn't come into the glycolytic cycle until it's a three carbon molecule. All right. And that's important because what I'm saying is fructose bypasses all the regulatory steps. And if you're eating a fruit, it's not that big of a deal. A fruit has a lot of fiber, which slows down absorption. Uh, there's only about five grams of fructose per serving of a fruit. 
It also comes packaged like other plants with lots of potassium, vasodilator, uh, magnesium, a vasodilator, has vitamin C, which is going to increase uh, excretion of uric acid. And that's relevant because, because it can so quickly get made into a three carbon sugar as part of glycolysis, it's not regulated. You can run through tons of ATP. They get converted next to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and then that gets made into uric acid. The uric acid then goes into the blood and that uric acid can cause some pretty significant problems in addition to gout. Everybody's heard of gout, but it can do other things as well. Also what happens, the end product of glycolysis is pyruvate, a three carbon sugar, okay? Another carboxylic acid, um, it's like a keto sugar. But anyways, the reason I mention it is that when it hits the end of glycolysis, the liver's like, hey, I don't need to make energy right now. I don't have any use for this. How did I get all this? Where did all this come from? Just make it into fat, make it into fat. So it goes to acetyl-CoA, that's a two carbon uh, binding with CoA and it just gets made into fat. So that's how you get a fatty liver from excessive amounts of high fructose corn syrup. Like I said, a lot of those people eating a lot of fruit, they're young, they got a high metabolism, they're exercising like crazy, but there is a reason why. So I think fruit in general is good most of the time, but there's certain catches about fruit. We're gonna come back to that in a moment. Okay, some definitions of obesity. BMI over 30, that's obese, all right? BMI over 40, that's morbid obesity. So what has happened? We talked about Chris Knob. He's going to say it's the cooking oils have taken off since the 1970s because the really rapid upward turn in the incidence of obesity especially happened after 1980. And there was a big uptick in the omega-6 cooking oils, like Chris Knob would say. There's a big uptick in high fructose corn syrup since the 1970s. That's going to be relevant too. Um, there's a big uptick in the amount of estrogen disrupting chemicals, estrogenic chemicals. And those also make a person gain weight because estrogen is a fat storage hormone. It tells a pregnant woman, you need to try to gain some weight because the baby might need that for energy. Um, then what else? There's been a dramatic increase in the amount of free glutamate in the food. Um, this, this chemical has dramatically increased in the food supply, both of these atrazine and glyphosate. So all of the, and then the the companies, the food companies have gotten smarter about how to make their food addictive to people. People are stressed out or more than ever with um, stress, sleep deprivation, and also they're drinking lots of caffeine, which has the same effects as stress. So for all these reasons, and what I'm saying here is it's not just one thing, it's a bunch of things that are all happening simultaneously to make people fatter. This was a good curve though by Chris Knob. He said, look, Everybody wants to blame stuff on saturated fat, but in his opinion, the intake of sat fat, according to his research, had not gone up that much. So that's especially in Japan, but he says it hasn't gone up that much. He says, the big thing that's increased is vegetable oils, you know, going back, let's say, especially you know, 1950s, 1960s, but much more so the last couple of decades. And he says that runs almost equal to the obesity curve, all right? Now he says, look at the sugar. Sugar was high long before that, and it doesn't seem to correlate hardly at all. I would say the one little trick here though is he just says sugar, which could mean a lot of things versus high fructose corn syrup, which I think is more what Lustig and Johnson were talking about and my understanding of it. All right, but this is still rather interesting, the way vegetable oils correlate so tightly, omega-6 cooking oils with the obesity curve. And the diabetes curve runs directly parallel to the obesity curve, okay? And this data set right here was for Japan, but he went through the data set and it all looked about the same for a bunch of different countries. Um, and I thought this was kind of interesting that sat fat in particular hadn't increased that much. Oh, and at the same time that Japanese have gotten a lot fatter, they've also gotten a lot more diabetes and they've also gotten a lot more dementia. That's gonna come relative too. So these all go together, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, dementia. They all go together. Okay, so here's one more curve from Chris Knob. And again, he's showing sugars. We're up long before all this other stuff and they don't explain uh, the increase in obesity and diabetes, okay? And this is for the USA, same thing. Striking correlation between obesity and diabetes and vegetable oils, virtually no correlation in his opinion to sugar. But, so you would say, does that refute Lustig and um, Johnson? But I would say, you know, Lustig and Johnson, they're not talking about all sugars. They're talking about fructose, especially high fructose corn syrup. So it's a little different. There's a subtle nuance, but it's relevant. Okay, omega-6 cooking oils. We're going to come back to this a little later, and we're going to go through some of the Yamashima research. He's a Japanese neuroscientist who sort of figured out why so many Japanese people are now becoming demented. But it's good that you've heard of this molecule here for uh, hydroxy nonanol. You'll usually see it abbreviated HNE. So the hydroxy, the H is for the hydroxy group. You'll sometimes see the number on it, usually not, but it's on the fourth carbon, okay? Known, N-O-N means nine. There's nine carbons, okay? Ene means a double bond. Here's a double bond. 
Al means aldehyde. So there's just a hydrogen attached to the carbonyl group. Carbonyl groups double bond to the, to the carbon. Okay. This molecule is very destructive. It's a toxic aldehyde produced by uh, omega-6 cooking oil undergoing what's called lipid peroxidation. And this also can inhibit uh, mitochondria at the ATP synthase part of the pathway. So it's a very damaging molecule. It's a good reason why Esselstyn is right. No oil, not one drop. That's the smart way to handle it. Okay, so we talked about how uric acid is a byproduct of high fructose corn syrup. And then it comes into the blood. It activates sympathetic autonomic nervous system, SANS, that's called. That will cause some hypertension. It's a bridging molecule, meaning that, you know, red blood cells have a negative charge around their outer surface called a zeta potential. And uric acid is one of the bridging molecules that can overcome the zeta potential, get the red blood cells to stick together, and that makes the blood thicker. A higher viscosity blood increases the risk of hypertension, okay? Um, hypertension is a major risk factor for silent strokes and for dementia, okay? It's probably the biggest risk factor for silent strokes. It also inhibits enos. Enos means endothelial nitric oxide synthase. That's what makes nitric oxide. When you can't make nitric oxide, the vasodilator, you get vasoconstriction. You get narrowing of uh, the arteries and the capillaries. Excuse me. And that's really relevant because when insulin comes up after a meal, it travels to the skeletal muscle and it opens up the arteries in the skeletal muscle, which it has to do because it has to get access to all those skeletal muscle individual cells. If the arteries and the small arterioles and capillaries are constricted in the skeletal muscle, then the insulin can't get access to the skeletal muscle cell. So the point I'm making here is inhibition of endothelial nitric oxide is going to cause insulin resistance. It's going to contribute to it. The main thing is the fat, but these are additional things that contribute to it. And it's worth knowing because let's say you've got type 2 diabetes, you're trying to get better, you're reducing your dietary fat, but you're just not improving as fast as you would like. Well, be aware of this. You know, it's a smart reason why you would want to avoid things with high fructose corn syrup in them. You want to avoid adding sodium because that's another, sodium's an inhibitor of endothelial nitric oxide. Okay, so you're not going to get the vasodilator. You won't be able to get as good of an insulin response. And because you have insulin resistance, you're going to raise your blood glucose, okay? And everything that goes with that, which is, that's going to be toxic to endothelial cells in the, in the brain, in the blood-brain barrier. Okay, but when you have high insulin because of insulin resistance, because that... The pancreas starts to compensate. This is called pancreatic compensation or beta cell compensation. When there's insulin resistance, the pancreas just keeps making more insulin. So insulin levels in the blood go up. And now to clear insulin out of the blood, there's something called IDE, insulin degrading enzyme. And that has a high affinity for insulin, uh, but it has another job. It also removes beta amyloid protein. So what happens is when you have chronically high levels of, of insulin in the blood, your insulin degrading enzyme produced in limited amounts gets used up removing all the high insulin and it's less able to clear out beta amyloid and that's thought to increase your risk of dementia. I'm going through all this because I'm trying to show you why would Lustig and Johnson be saying high fructose corn syrup causes dementia and this is why, okay? Also, when you get fatty liver, you're gonna raise VLDL, you know, very low density lipoproteins and triglyceride in the blood, which is not good. Okay, um, here's the catch with uh, fruits, fruits and fructose. They don't satisfy hunger the same way starches do. Starch is a polymer of glucose and it's wrapped in fiber. So as soon as it goes in your stomach, it stretches your stomach. That causes early satisfaction of hunger. Then it goes into your small intestine and it takes time for your intestinal enzymes to peel off the fiber before the glucose can be absorbed in your blood. And you get this slow, steady um, passage of glucose from your gut into your blood. It's like a slow release energy pill. You satisfy your hunger with the fewest number of calories. And that's why starch eating populations are so skinny. That's why the starch is the best food in the world. That's also why I can tell you, you know, I'm triple boarded. I'm trained in a couple other medical fields. I've been a doctor over 30 years. And I can tell you the most important thing I ever learned in my entire educational medical career about health is that humans should eat starch. And you could take somebody living in a backward, illiterate, society and they just eat a lot of starch and they'll be healthy and then you could take you know the harvard chief of public whatever of a nutrition internal medicine whatever who doesn't know that and they'll be fat and sick okay that's the most important thing you could know all right now getting back to fruit what is the potential problem with fruit well because you know fructose is like fruit sugar they don't raise blood glucose that quickly they don't create this insulin response and they don't satisfy hunger as well okay and i know this you know, everybody's probably had this experience i'll start eating apples I'll go through five, through 10, through 12, 14. I'm like, holy crap, I just ate so many apples. How come they didn't fill me up? If I eat a bowl full of starch, you know, a bunch of potatoes and rice and beans, I'm full. I go, whoa, I'm full. I don't need any more of this. But even after I've gotten full eating this giant bowl, 
My wife calls it the Shrek bowl. Okay. Even after I've eaten all that, I can still pound down tons, giant bowls of fruit. So what I'm trying to say is my hunger system tells me you've had enough to eat, no more starch. But it doesn't tell me stop with the fruits. I could keep going with the fruits. I used to always have to stop eating apples by counting myself. Okay, okay, I won't have more than 10 because I knew I could easily have 15 and keep going. And so what I'm saying is that's one of the problems of fruits. They don't satisfy hunger the same way the starches do. So you do have the possibility of overeating with them. And as you get older, you don't have as high a metabolic rate. Plus a lot of us are working a lot or we're sleep deprived a little bit. So we can't just go out and run as much as we would like to burn off the calories. Exercise is a fantastic thing to lower insulin resistance, but it's not as readily available to us quite often because we're working all the time as we get older. Anyways, this is the endothelial cell. That's the lining cells of your arteries. And the most important thing it does to keep good blood flow is it makes nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a gas. It diffuses into the blood and it inhibits the platelets from clotting. So that's very important. You don't want your blood to clot. By the way, hardly anybody dies from bleeding. You see that on a TV show. Somebody dies from bleeding. In real life, almost everybody dies from blood clots, okay? Blood clot in the heart, heart attack. Blood clot in the brain, that's a stroke. Blood clot, you know, in the small arteries going to the Johnson pudendal arteries, impotence. Blood clots in the little uh, parts of the ear that go to the auditory nerve, deafness, okay? In the eye, blindness. What I'm trying to say is most of these health problems are caused by blood clots. And hypoxia in, to a tissue also makes that tissue much more likely to undergo a Warburg effect and cause cancer, okay? Um, by the way, MSG, one of the reasons why I went through all that um, manufacturer-free glutamate was the author of that book, that lady, uh, Catherine Reed, she claims that it's under-recognized. In her opinion, manufacturer-free glutamate in high amounts, she believes that's a major contributor to increasing the incidence of cancer. So I'll need more time to read all those papers. I haven't gone through all those papers yet, but you know, she's a pretty smart lady, and she claims that's a big contributor to increased cancer risk, people eating dramatically abnormal high amounts of free glutamate. So I'll have to read about that. I don't know for sure, but I think that's an interesting thing to look at. Okay, what else? Nitric oxide, it's a gas. It diffuses also into the wall of the artery. It goes to the vascular smooth muscle cells and it causes them to relax, which dilates the artery. That's why it's a vasodilator. There's a whole bunch of other things it does here, but if you only had to know one thing, just know nitric oxide. If you get that, then everything else kind of just follows that path. All right, so we talked about dietary fructose, especially high fructose corn syrup, leading to increased UA, that's uric acid, that inhibits endothelial nitric oxide. Now the insulin can't get access to all the skeletal muscle cells, so you get insulin resistance. Blood glucose goes up. Okay, so here's just a continuation of the same diagram showing a few more steps. When you get the insulin resistance, blood glucose goes up, now you've got diabetes. Diabetes is a major contributor to dementia. You know, in my personal experience, like over a thousand cases, over 90% of the patients had both diabetes and hypertension or at least one of them, okay? I would say 90% of them had, had both diabetes and hypertension, another 5% had one or the other. And sometimes I think that's probably because it wasn't in the chart. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is they go hand in hand with becoming demented. And, you know, it's been my experience, a lot of doctors, I know my friends, they say all their patients over 60, they're all mentally slow. And I would tell you, take a look at the vegan community. Look at a lot of these older vegan experts, okay? Look at McDougal, look at Esselstyn, look at uh, Campbell and many of these other ones. Look how smart they are. That is a very unique thing to the vegan community, okay? They're really smart. Look at Ruth Hydras, how mentally smart she is. That is a, is a good sign because they got clean arteries going to their brain. I think a lot of these other patients, they're not mentating as sharp as they would when they were younger because they got a lot of vascular problems in their brain uh, from all the diabetes and uh, hypertension. Okay. Oh, by the way, this is a book I wrote. I recently wrote this book. It's Poor Man's Way to Prevent Dementia and Raise IQ, especially it focuses on preventing dementia. It's about 450 pages. The big thing about it is I got lots of illustrations in there. These are my old wrestling coaches, world and Olympic champions. Uh, this is David Schultz and Mark Schultz. I learned a ton of stuff from them. I learned more from them when I was at Stanford than anyone else. I learned tons of things from them. Okay. I'm um, getting back to diabetes now. Here are sort of what you can call conceptual stages of diabetes. I just sort of made this myself uh, based on all my reading, uh, but so it'll, it'll make sense here. And what I would say, the typical patient in my experience says, oh, my diabetes is under control, it's under control. And what they mean by that is they're taking their pills, okay? And their sugars are not that bad. Um, what I would say they should be saying to themselves instead is I become a low fat vegan, I'm trying to cure it, all right? And so when you accumulate fat in the skeletal muscle, that's the earliest detectable finding of insulin resistance 
you then can't get glucose into the muscle after eating a meal, like that diagram we just showed a moment ago on an earlier slide. So that's after eating, that's called postprandial. So you get postprandial high blood glucose, that's hyperglycemia. Okay, so that's an important point from the fat and the skeletal muscle. All right, then you start accumulating fat in the liver. And the liver's job is to maintain normal blood glucose during fasting. So once the liver becomes fatty, it can no longer accurately sense blood glucose level, and it keeps on running gluconeogenesis and releasing glucose into the blood, even when blood glucose levels are high. So now you get a high blood sugar even while fasting. So this is fasting hyperglycemia. And by the way, fatty liver is so common, the majority of middle-aged and older Americans have fatty liver, okay? I could be looking at a CAT scan for whatever the reason, and the liver will routinely be fat, or on an ultrasound is even more sensitive for detection of fatty liver. All right, eventually they start accumulating fat in the pancreas, and once they get a lot of uh, fatty atrophy of the pancreas, quite often they've lost their beta cell function, and now they're insulin dependent for the rest of their life. And that's pretty routine. You ask any radiologist, you ever seen a fatty atrophy of pancreas? They'll go, yeah, I see it all the time. They probably won't know that that's associated with insulin dependent diabetes, but it is. Okay, um, and we're going to come back to some research of Roy Taylor and how he showed that fatty liver can be reversed pretty easily and that basically you should think of diabetes uh, as primarily being related to fatty liver in his opinion. I'll explain why he says that. The next thing that happens is when you have when you have high blood glucose around the clock, you know, fasting, fasting because of the liver, fatty liver, and postprandial because of the fat in the muscles, you then have other cells in the body which do not have those glucose type four transporters. They just take up whatever glucose is in the blood proportionally. And that includes cells in your retina. That includes cells in your arteries, your endothelial cells. That includes cells in your kidney, uh, like the kidney medulla. And those cells in your peripheral nerves, diabetic neuropathy of the foot. So those cells, they can't control it. So if you could have chronic high blood glucose, they get flooded with glucose. And that too can damage the mitochondria when there's a dramatic flood of glucose coming in over and over 24 seven, all right? So that will activate the same thing about reversing electron transport, causing a backup of all the related uh, energy pathways, Krebs cycle and then glycolysis. So Krebs cycle in the mitochondrial matrix and glycolysis in the um, cytoplasm. The other thing about diabetics is you go to any Western hospital and every day on the operating room schedule, there's gonna be a bunch of amputations of the toes. And then sometimes eventually uh, the lower part of the leg, you know, and then of the upper part of the leg even. And the reason I say this, it's because they get this microvasculopathy in their foot. And then the doc is basically screwed. There's nothing you could do. You get a smoker. They're going to have aortoiliac disease. You can put a stent in there. You can do a surgical bypass pretty easily. You got good inflow. You got good outflow. But when you get down in the foot, the distal vessels are too small. You can't get an angioplasty balloon in there. You can't put a stent in such a small artery. You can't bypass. There's nothing to bypass to amputation. That's it. They get tons of amputations. And then usually by the time they're having all this, they're so mentally slow, they can't understand anything. It's like, you know, I'm talking to this guy, you might want to change your diet. You just got one foot amputated. He's like, oh, I'm doing fine. I'm like, no, you're not. But it's it's hard to talk to him. It's kind of sad. It's real sad. Okay. Here, what's the other point about this fat? This is a good paper by Anthony J. James Hamilton, 2020. Uh, putative inhibitors of fatty acid transport across membranes. Okay, and so what did they find? What they found was they inhibited the fatty acid uh, membrane uh, protein transporters, and it really didn't matter. The fatty acids were intercalating into the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane, and then they were able to flip-flop into the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane and then come into the cytoplasm. And it was just dependent on the concentration of fat in the blood. So that's a problem. What it means is you can't stop it with uh, by coming up with a pill to inhibit these uh, these transporters, okay? And like I said, too, what did Shulman say? The best researcher in the whole world for diabetes. He says, we don't have any medicines that are effective at uh, stopping insulin resistance. <laughs> like I said, we got one. It's called a low-fat vegan diet. All right, so anyways, that's a big deal. That's like one of the most important things you know. The only way you could do this is reduce your dietary fat. The way you could reduce that happening. Okay, now this guy's name is Michael Brownlee. And he's a type one diabetic. So he was interested, and the guy's a genius. He was interested in studying diabetes because he wanted to save his own life. And he did. He wrote this paper here uh, called The Unifying Theory of Diabetic Complications. And the paper is so beautiful. I had been reading, you know, for months on end, trying, you know, all my free time, trying to understand diabetes. And so many papers are just like trying to make a drug or they're all 
stuck on one little point. They're not able to put it all together. And I read this guy's point, I, his paper. I almost started crying. It was like an academic orgasm. It was such a beautiful paper. It was, this is like the Sistine Chapel of diabetes papers. It's so magnificent. You just re read it. It's like you're in awe of it. You can actually hear his lecture. If you go to the American Diabetic Association.org, ADA.org, you have to sign in though to hear his lecture, but you can get the paper for free. Um, and he goes through every step of how all these diabetic complications happen. And the main point is that electron transport is inhibited and then diabetes reverses. Okay, and see how he draws um, electrons dropping off of coenzyme Q and then combining with oxygen in the mitochondrial matrix that forms superoxide anions. That's a free radical electron unpaired in the outer orbital, meaning that it's hyperreactive and can cause damaging chain reactions. Okay. And when this is blocked, you get an excessive amount of these, what's called electron leak, electron leak from electron transport chain. Electron transport chain is like a fireman bucket brigade handing off an electron as it sort of like passes down a hill, if you will. And then oxygen normally is the ultimate electron acceptor. What that means is oxygen has a very high electronegativity. What that means is oxygen wants to grab electrons. That's why they call it the ultimate, ultimate electron acceptor. And so it is the strongest grabber of electrons. That's how they, they're able to roll downhill till they get to the oxygen. And then it's just made into water, you know, something harmless, okay? You breathe it off with a little vapor in your breath. All right. And so he'll go through all these complications. I'll show some of the slides either. You can't get an abstract for it. You know, I think it's some of these famous places for research papers, you can't even get the paper, but you can get it ada.org, okay? And that's a common experience I have is that paper you really want to read, you can't get it. <laughs> Okay, a paper that promotes some corporate product. Oh, it's easy to find the entire thing for free. All right, now here's one point about something called carbohydrate tolerance. Because some people diabetic will say, well, if I eat carbs, my, my sugar goes way too high. Well, the point is if they eat fat first, the fat will have caused insulin resistance. And then if they eat carbs after that, they're gonna get a big spike in their blood glucose. But if they only eat the starch, for example, and don't eat any fat first, their blood glucose doesn't come up that much. I mean, it's normal that it comes up a little bit after you eat. That's what it's supposed to do, but it doesn't come up that much. So this is the idea of carbohydrate tolerance. So eating high fat foods by causing insulin resistance, they lower their carbohydrate tolerance, lower the ability of the person to eat carbohydrates. All right, now here's the, the guy I was gonna tell you about, Gerald Shulman, all right? And he uh, was a brilliant guy, he's a genius. He did his work out at Yale. He's both a physicist and a fellowship trained endocrinologist. And he worked with something called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, whereby he could see the individual molecules in a cell and measure their amounts. So he could tell virtually almost in real time what was happening in a cell. And he confirmed what we had known earlier from the 1920s, the J. Shirley Sweeney paper, that the first detectable finding of insulin resistance is the accumulation of fat in the skeletal muscle cell. The more fat you eat, the more insulin resistance you have. And he even did research experiments where he would infuse uh, free fatty acids into the blood. And as soon as he do that, it would take sometimes about three hours, the person would then develop insulin resistance at that point. So you flood the skeletal muscle with the fat, then they get that overnutrition sense and they won't take glucose in anymore. So now you're gonna have increased glucose in the blood. Okay, and then here's what I think is like one of the most interesting things he says. He says, why is this happening? Is this mean that the body is defective or is the body doing something that it should be doing? He says, he thinks it's from an evolutionary point of view that when the human body has high blood lipids in our ancestors, that meant that they were starving, okay? When you're starving, you start breaking down your fat and shipping that around the body to provide energy for the different tissues. So he thinks what's happening is high blood lipids makes the body think that it's starving and that insulin resistance is an adaptive mechanism. It wants to free up the available glucose for the parts of the body that require glucose, the brain, the spinal cord, you can call that the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, also red blood cells. You know, they run on glycolysis. They don't have any mitochondria, okay? Because they're afraid it would steal the oxygen. The red blood cells, the kidney medulla, okay? So he's saying that, it's an adaptive mechanism in the context of hyperlipidemia, high lipids in the blood to make sure that blood glucose is as high as possible so you can get some glucose to the brain because uh, that's what you got to do. You know, you got to keep the brain working. That's the entire most important point of the liver is make sure the brain has enough glucose. So there it is. Hyperlipidemia to our ancestors who always worried about starving meant that the body thought it was starving and therefore insulin resistance was activated to make sure <laughs> excuse me, glucose was available uh, to the brain. And there's one other point of view on this that I'm gonna share with you. This comes from Richard Johnson. 
Richard Johnson says, hey, there's a little more to it than that. In his opinion, the reason why you get insulin resistance from eating excessive amounts of fructose, he says, this is how a bear fattens up for winter so it can hibernate a bit, is by having insulin resistance, you get to make more fat and that can help it survive the winter when it hibernates, okay? So that's what he thinks is a major part of the contributing to that. All right, here is, you know, just basically a summary of normal, oh no, this is type two diabetes. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Decreased glucose production. This is Shulman's slides here. So basically, you know, you get insulin resistance and then you're gonna have fat accumulating the skeletal muscle and then it goes to the liver, then it goes to the pancreas. All right, but I recommend, if you're interested in understanding diabetes, biochemistry and stuff, you wanna study Shulman. Shulman won the Banting Award in 2018 as the best diabetes researcher in the world. Uh, Michael Brownlee won the Banting Award in 2004 as the best diabetes researcher in the world. Roy Taylor won it in 2012. Now we're going to talk about Roy Taylor in just a moment. By the way, here's the Kempner diet. It was about 93% carbohydrate, um, especially rice, also some fruits, 4% uh, protein. That's an incredibly low amount of protein, 4% protein, 3% fat, okay? And you can read about this. Uh, this lady, doctor, Dr. Newborg, was like his assistant. They worked together. Then she wrote a biography of him. It was quite good. Um, so anyways, they would weigh in in public, you know, at the rice houses and whoever lost 100 pounds, get the picture on the wall. So anyways, the point though was Kempner put patients on an incredibly low fat diet. And the reason that's important is all of these places, the most common thing you hear told to diabetics is that they should eat, you know, some version of a, um, a high fat Mediterranean keto type diet. And I would completely disagree with that as do the guys at Mastering Diabetes, Dr. McDougall and uh, other members of the low fat vegan community. Okay. So, and, and Kempner had about 19,000 patients and he had incredible results. He showed patients who reversed their diabetic retinopathy. Lots of them reversed their hypertension. Hypertension and diabetes really go together very much. Okay. So now here's Roy Taylor. He's an English physician endocrinologist. He did some research at Yale with uh, Gerald Shulman and the nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. He won the Banting Award 2012. And in his opinion, the most important thing to do is to reverse fatty liver, because when you reverse fatty liver, he says you will reverse type 2 diabetes. Um, he even defines type 2 diabetes as fat accumulation in the liver. And he took a whole bunch of patients that had been diabetic for only four years or less. So here's his Banting lecture of 2012 as the best diabetes researcher in the whole world. And the, if you have a patient who had type 2 diabetes less than four years, almost all of them could reverse it if they lose about you know 25 to 30 pounds or so. Okay. And he also says there's a trend in fatty liver of the ALT uh, starts drifting upward, the liver enzymes. Okay. Um, so here it was, he showed with MRI that at baseline his type two diabetics had an average of about 36% of their liver contents was fat. But once they lost 30 or more pounds, they then dropped their liver percent fat down to 2%. So one of the points of this is one of the first places your body loses fat from is the liver, because it's really the metabolic workhorse of the body. It's what maintains blood glucose for the brain. It's what detoxifies everything for your body. The size of the liver is a little, you know, like a big football. It's like the biggest thing in the abdomen by far. If you ever look at a CAT scan, you keep tapping on it, your liver, 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 liver. It's on almost every image. It's big. All right, so he put patients on like these, these weight loss shakes and he restricted calories. And Kempner did some calorie restriction too with his patients, especially when he wanted to rapidly get down their body weights. But the reason I'm telling you this is, you know, you got to eat every day for the rest of your life. So why don't you do something sustainable and you don't have to buy some nutrient shake, just eat low fat vegan diet. Well, once his patients lost these 30 pounds, zip, their blood glucose is just, you know, dramatically came back to normal in Roy Taylor's work. And again, these are patients with diabetes less than four years. The longer they've had the diabetes, the more likely they will have lost their pancreatic beta cells. Pancreatic beta cells are the ones that make insulin. And then Chef AJ, she's got everything. She's got books on how to lose weight. She's got a bunch of lectures on how to lose weight. So, I mean, think about it. You go take a bunch of pills that aren't going to cure you, have a lot of side effects. You probably just progressively, gradually deteriorate. Or you can go, you know, learn how to lose weight and, you know, got a good chance to probably cure yourself. I mean, it's not a... Smart choice is obvious, okay? Here's what happens with glucose when it comes into a cell. It first gets phosphor phosphorylated by an enzyme like hexokinase, HK there, and that traps it in the cell so it can't go back out of the cell. It undergoes glycolysis quite often, gets converted to pyruvate. Pyruvate goes in the Krebs cycle, then is acetyl-CoA, 
and that makes electron carriers. They go to the inner mitochondrial membrane here. Here's the outer mitochondrial membrane, intermembrane space, inner mitochondrial membrane. This is the mitochondrial matrix. And you, that's how you make your ATP. Oh, here's just a better picture of a mitochondria. Outer mitochondrial membrane, usually abbreviated OMM. It's worth knowing about this because this is how life on earth exists because of this. Um, IMS, intermembrane space, inner mitochondrial membrane right here, IMM. And mitochondrial matrix is the inner part. Krebs cycle runs in here, okay? So the pyruvate comes in here, you get it made into acetyl-CoA, and then it runs through uh, Krebs cycle. Okay, again, this is the fireman bucket brigade of complexes passing down electrons like uh, to progressively stronger grabbers of electrons. And then they pump protons into the inner membrane of space, building up this really pressurized gradient. And the gradient across this membrane here is negative 160 millivolts. That's an incredible gradient. A neuron only has a gradient of, let's say, negative 65 or negative 70 millivolts. This is an, a giant, massive gradient. It's like a coal-burning electric plant. It's an incredibly powerful thing. It's a rather amazing thing. Peter Mitchell in the 1960s won the Nobel Prize for figuring that out. Okay, so we talked about how fat will inhibit this. And then what happens is, Everything backs up. Krebs cycle backs up in the mitochondrial matrix and glycolysis backs up, backs up in a cytoplasm. In particular, this album, this uh, enzyme gets inhibited. I usually call it 3-PGA, 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde dehydrogenase. And once this enzyme gets inhibited, then this intermediate right before it, the substrate is going to accumulate. And once this accumulates, it's going to go through all these pathological side reactions. And that creates a metabolic disaster in the cell. Okay, one of the things that happens is you produce, you remember I talked about when you block this because of fat, you start dropping, or it's called electron leak. More electrons keep dropping into the uh, mitochondrial matrix. In order to make oxygen turn into water, it has to accept four electrons. And that fully reduces it so that it can become water and it's safe. But when it happens right here, it only gets one electron, it becomes superoxide. It has an unpaired electron in its outer orbital. What that just means is it's hyperreactive and it can damage all kinds of things. It can, it can damage uh, DNA. You get activation of a DNA repair enzyme called PARP. Okay. You, you want to know, you, if you're interested in biochemistry, it's good to know that. You don't have to know. The most important thing to know, let's say, if you just want to get better from diabetes is what should you eat and what should you avoid? And we already kind of talked about that. Eat a low fat diet. Don't use extra sodium. Eat a lot of plant foods. Okay. We're going to go into that in more detail. But anyways, what I'm trying to say is once you block 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde dehydrogenase and this starts accumulating, it's going to, first of all, form methylglyoxyl, MGO, which produces all the advanced glycation end products. Then it's going to uh, produce a lot of diacylglycerol that's going to block lots of other pathways, including cause insulin resistance. And what I'm trying to say is it creates a disaster in the cell. Um, everything goes wrong in your cells and in your blood vessels. And it reminded me of the line spoken by Mark Antony in the Julius Caesar play by William Shakespeare. Cry havoc and let and let slip the dogs of war. I mean, basically, you just start destroying things all over your body. It's, it's, it's terrible. So you really don't want this. And that's why it's a big mistake for the average patient to say, Oh, it's under control. I'm taking my pill. You know, like you don't understand. You don't want this insulin resistance. It's very damaging. That's also why I don't think these high fat diets are a good idea because even if you restrict carbohydrates from the body, and you can lower your blood glucose temporarily. You still have high insulin resistance. So you're still causing all kinds of damaging side pathways in your body. Yeah. And Dr. McDougall has gone through all the papers, all these uh, high fat diets. They all have increased mortality, cardiovascular mortality, all cause mortality. And this is an example this increase in diacylglycerol, the side effect of uh, 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde accumulating, it activates all these bad pathways. You inhibit endothelial nitric uh, oxide. So now you get vasoconstriction. You also now will have more platelet aggregation. So you're prothrombotic, meaning you tend to clot. Okay, that's you know the pathway to end up with an amputation. Um, you get increased growth of blood vessels due to the ischemia from the microvasculopathy in the eye. And there's other things about it too, because the increased vascular permeability, you end up with a retinopathy. You go blind, okay? You get more inflammation, oxidative stress. Everything bad starts happening. Okay, a little bit about uh, advanced glycation end products. So this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, again, I usually like to call it 3-PGA, three 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde. Three so three, because the phosphate's on carbon number three. Glycer is like the backbone of three carbons. 
aldehyde because there's a high, just a hydrogen attached to the carbonyl group. Okay, so that's three phosphoglyceraldehyde. Gets made into MgO, methylglyoxal, that can exit the cell, and it will then form these irreversible bonds, combinations with proteins all over the body, matrix proteins in the extracellular matrix. It'll damage collagen, and collagen's a long-lived protein, so it sits there for a long time, and it can just cause chronic damage. If you get hemoglobin A1C elevated in your blood, which red blood cells last about three months, so the amount of hemoglobin A1C is an indicator of the last three months of your blood glucose control, but at least the red blood cells get cleared, okay? Some of this collagen, it just sits there for a long, long time, and it's all damaged by these um, glycation end products. Okay, the glycation end products can be taken up into other cells by what's called the RAGE receptor. And that just means receptor for advanced glycation end products. And that leads to activation of these other inflammatory pathways that are also prothrombotic, increased platelet aggregation. So you got all of these bad things happening and you're gonna be thickening your capillary basement membranes, dropping your uh, gas exchange, delivery of oxygen to tissues, increasing your risk of cancer um, and a lot of other bad problems and of uh, uh, dementia. Okay, and this is what I kind of talked about earlier. Cells that cannot regulate the uptake of glucose because they don't have GLUT4s, they get too much glucose coming in during hyperglycemia, uh, production of reactive oxygen species. But here's something that a lot of people don't know about. You get immune suppression because you'll glycate your antibodies so they can't function as part of your immune system as effectively. So there's immune suppression with diabetes. Um, in addition, you can glycate your uh, antibodies and distort their shape so that other antibodies now recognize them as foreign. And it's all, you can almost call that the auto auto antibody. <laughs> Bottom line is it can worsen autoimmune disease. That's bad, you don't want that. Diabetes is like a metabolic disaster. All right, I just wanted to briefly talk about these advanced glycation end products because they're higher in foods that are high protein, they're higher in foods that are high fat. So they're really high, especially too, if you fry a food or you roast it, super high off the charts for fried bacon. Look at that, 12,000. Uh, advanced glycation end product units. In comparison, you know, the fruit, you're looking around, you know, 10, okay, next to nothing. And our body, you know, it's normal to have some of these and our body's quite good at clearing them out when they're present in small amounts. But you go to, you know, these real high fat things, like look at olive oil, like 500, okay. Uh, mayonnaise, avocados are quite high as well. And I wouldn't eat this because of the coating they now put on it. I wouldn't eat that anyways. I wouldn't eat it anyways because it's high fat, but now with the coating they put it on, I wouldn't eat it at all. Okay, but I, I wanted to make that point. Okay, another point too, this is by Michael Brownlee, the guy who wrote that unifying paper of diabetes. He said, almost all diabetes patients die from coronary artery disease. Okay, so, you know, it makes sense. You know, something like the Esselstyn diet, low fat vegan diet, no uh, meats, no sweets, no oils to protect those arteries. That's really what you want to think about is arterial health. Okay, William Osler said, a man is only is as old as his arteries. So if you've got healthy arteries, you know, you're physiologically younger than you would otherwise be. That's an important quote. Almost all diabetics die from coronary artery disease. So if I was diabetic, I would want to do everything to prevent coronary artery disease. And then here was another thing that was kind of interesting. I became interested in the concept of mitochondrial inhibitors because I was reading all about mechanisms and neurodegeneration in the brain. So I go back through all my biochemistry books and there's like, nothing on mitochondrial inhibitors. I go, this can't be right. So I start going through the papers and very quickly I found 50 of them. Well, we just talked about how when you inhibit electron transport, that's the mechanism of causing insulin resistance with diabetes. Well, don't you think these other things are gonna to contribute to it? If I had diabetes, I would avoid all these things, okay? Um, I didn't have time to go through all the papers and find all the papers on these, but it would be a wise move in my opinion to avoid these things because they're bad for your health in general. You don't want anything that's going to inhibit your mitochondrial electron transport. And I found about over 50 of them really fast. Excuse me. And a lot of these things are real common. Look at this. Tylenol has a negative effect on mitochondrial electron transport. So of real common things. Metformin. I've had some doctors, fellowship trained doctors tell me, oh, I heard metformin increases longevity. Do you think I should take it? I said, you want to take a mitochondrial inhibitor? I wouldn't do that. Okay, a lot of these um, psychiatric meds, Haldol, you know, antipsychotic meds, a lot of these SSRIs, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors for treatment, typically of depression, are mitochondrial inhibitors. So the point I'm saying is there's a lot of things, antifungals, you know, mold inhibitors, uh, a lot of them are um, inhibitors of electron transport. Your heavy metals are quite often inhibitors of this. Alcohol contributes to inhibition of this. So anyways, there's a lot of them. And I think all of these things contribute to brain damage. 
Um, and I'll explain that, you know, I've explained that in previous lectures and, but they do. Okay. Because they're going to decrease the neurons ability to make ATP and you need high levels of ATP to manage calcium effectively. And if you can't manage calcium effectively, you end up with excitotoxic brain damage. All right. So here's the hippocampus, the memory center. We talked in the past about the Jack Delatory theory of dementia. You tie off the mouse's carotid artery, and then the mouse will typically become demented middle age and older mice about two months later. And he called this the uh, chronic cerebral hypoperfusion. It's also called the vascular hypothesis of dementia. I call it the mouse equivalent theory of dementia because anything that drops blood supply to the brain is going to increase the likelihood that the brain doesn't get enough oxygen and glucose. And at first, people say, well, how many people get stenosis of the severe stenosis or occlusion of the cervical internal carotid artery? Not that many, you know, end up being recommended for carotid endarterectomy surgery or stenting, but tons of people have atrial fibrillation, tons of people congestive heart failure, aortic stenosis of the valve, aortic regurgitation of the aortic valve. Um, lots of people overtreat their hypertension. They bring the pressure down too low. Um, and then if you have chronic high blood pressure, you get this high pulse pressure hitting at the little vessels in your brain, and that'll cause cerebral atherosclerosis. They used to call that Asian atherosclerosis in the Japanese because they were smoking so many cigarettes and eating so much salt that they had a lot of hypertension. So they would get this intracranial atherosclerosis, and the high fat eating Westerners would get coronary atherosclerosis and uh, cervical carotid atherosclerosis. So, anyways, that's a vascular hypothesis of dementia. And here's an example of where you're really kind of stuck. This is the skull and crossbones. Here's the ventricles where the cerebral spinal fluid is stored. And this periventricular area is the most common spot of silent strokes. I see tons of these. One patient can have over 100 of them. If the pressure is super high, they'll have a tendency to shear off one of these ventricular strides. So here's the carotid artery comes up into the brain. It bifurcates into there's an anterior cerebral artery not drawn. Then there's a middle cerebral artery going out over the convexities of the brain. These are called lenticular strides. Real high pressure will sometimes shear off these lenticular strides. And you get little hemorrhagical coonar infarcts usually real tiny. I seldom see a big bleed in the brain. That's actually super rare. Okay. But if you don't get enough blood up over the top, because you've got hypertension induced atherosclerosis in these vessels, or if you overtreat your hypertension, you get little silent strokes in this area. And that's a common reason why older people become cognitively slow. And here's a perfect example. All these white spots, they should not be here. This would be a patient. It's like, how do you count the strokes? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is all coalescent. Is that a couple of them put together? Probably nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. I see this all day long every day. This would be a, you know, a pretty typical looking 85 year old brain, but I see plenty of brains like this in their 50s and 60s, uh, patients who've got you know bad lifestyle habits, really poor diets and a lot of hypertension and diabetes. Okay, here's how a neuron works. Cell body over here where the DNA is in the nucleus. Uh, when it gets a message, excitatory message, it'll send an action potential down to the synaptic terminal. Uh, sodium channels send the action potential. When it reaches the synaptic terminal, then it opens up voltage-gated calcium channels. And the increase in the cytoplasm calcium will cause a neurotransmitter vesicle to merge with the plasma membrane on the presynaptic neuron. And then the neurotransmitters are released across the cleft, bind with the postsynaptic neuron, and exert an effect. Over 90% of... Uh, of neurotransmitters in the brain are glutamine excitatory. Okay. That's about 90% of them. And then you could say in the ballpark of 5% are GABA. Okay. And GABA is the break. So GABA turns things off. So uh, glutamate's like a light switch, turn things on. GABA is like going in the opposite direction or accelerator with glutamate and the break with, um, with GABA. And then the other ones that everybody always talks about, they're actually quite rare, you know, like less than a percent. And that would be things like uh, serotonin, acetylcholine, uh, norepinephrine and dopamine. They're really relatively uncommon neurotransmitter modulators of glutamate function in the brain. Okay, we've talked about this before. You need to have intact gradients of sodium across your plasma membranes and potassium, and you need magnesium to run these ATP pumps. So if you eat too much dietary sodium, as most Americans do, you start to dissipate these gradients and you decrease the ability of the cell to do its job. It needs these gradients to pump calcium out. So it less it becomes less skilled at pumping calcium out. And that can over time lead to worse and worse hypertension and also cognitive decline. All right. So, and there's also something called, let me just show you what excitotoxicity is about. If you have too much glutamate neurotransmitter here coming from the vesicles, releasing the synaptic cleft, binding to the postsynaptic neuron, um, it binds two types of receptors. AMPAs are sodium channels, but then it binds these NMDA channels 
and those are calcium channels. Notice that there's also a glycine bound here, and that's thought that gly glyphosate activates this. Notice also there's a magnesium that typically blocks these, these channels until the sodium amporeceptor depolarizes the cell first. All of this is relevant because if you're deficient in magnesium, this, this receptor becomes uh, hyperactive and you get more and more calcium coming into the postsynaptic neuron and that can overexcite it and cause it to die through apoptosis, exhaustion basically. Okay, so magnesium protects you. Where does magnesium come from? It comes from plants. It's in the center of chlorophyll. Okay, and if you get excessive amounts of calcium in this postsynaptic neuron, and this also is made worse if you if you have your mitochondria inhibited by those over 50 things I just showed you or by excessive dietary fat, then you're not going to be able to make enough ATP to pump out this uh, this calcium to turn off calpain. So calpain is a perfect name for this toxic enzyme. Cal, because it's activated by calcium. Pain, because there's painful consequences for this being activated. Okay, one of the things it'll do is it'll destroy the knockout exchanger, which pumps calcium out of the cell. So you get this vicious cycle going and the cell dies in, by apoptosis, okay? All right, this is my theory of dementia. Normally, you should have coupling, meaning that the glucose oxygen delivery is matched to the metabolic rate. But if you have things that increase the metabolic rate of the neuron due to stimulants, you know, smoking tobacco, uh, caffeine, sleep deprivation, increasing glutamate transmission, psychological stress, you're increasing metabolic rate. The psychological stress and the uh, caffeine and sleep deprivation, they're also vasoconstrictors to the brain and they'll drop blood, the blood delivery to the brain a little bit as well. Then you eat a high fat meal, you drop oxygen delivery to the brain some more. You have sodium, you vasoconstrict. So the gap between the metabolic rate of the neuron and the glucose and oxygen delivery keeps getting wider and wider. And once it gets too wide, then the brain cells can't compensate anymore. And then they die through apoptosis. And this happens gradually over the course of decades. The person just keeps losing more neurons. And that's what I see when I look at these brain MRIs of dementia. I, it's usually not due to some stroke, the classic old fashioned idea of vascular dementia. I just see a brain chronically shrinking, meaning it gets more and more atrophic. You see enlargement of the cell size along the cerebral convexities because there's less brain tissue and more cerebral spinal fluid to fill that fixed space of the skull. And uh, so here's a whole bunch of things that are decreasing glucose and oxygen delivery. I jokingly called it GOD. Usually it's called OGD, oxygen glucose delivery, but as a joke, I called it GOD. Okay, um, and then anything that don't increase the metabolic rate will make it worse as well, okay? Um, and I think you gotta be real careful. A lot of things, just because something's called a medication doesn't mean it's a bad idea. You know, if you were on a street corner, it would be against the law to sell an amphetamine uh, to another person but then you're going to give that to a kid. I think, in my opinion, I think that's a bad idea. Okay. All right. Now here's part of how diabetes causes brain damage. You know, if you go back and look at all the textbooks, they're going to tell you that neurons uh, are not sensitive to problems with insulin resistance, that insulin resistance is irrelevant for neurons, but that's completely wrong. Once you read the paper, you see there's tons of papers that show that your hippocampal neurons and neurons in other locations in the brain will often have glucose type four transporters. So that means they are insulin dependent and you need insulin and insulin sensitivity to get these glucose type four transporters up to the plasma membrane. So what'll happen is you're gonna have glucose type one transporters across the BBB, blood brain barrier. Um, and you're also gonna have some glucose type three transporters. These are also not insulin dependent, glucose type one and type three. So glucose will pass right across the glucose type one. It'll pass right through the glucose type three but you need to also get it through these glucose type fours if you're gonna have adequate amounts of glucose for a highly active neuron. And because insulin resistance in the body also causes insulin resistance in the brain, you're not able to get enough glucose to these neurons. And again, that puts them at risk for excitotoxicity like we were just talking about, being overstimulated. Um, and it's gonna put them at risk for another type of uh, brain damage I'll show here in, in, the, in the next slide. Okay, all right, so... When you're walking, you know, what's the purpose of a brain? The purpose of a brain is to walk down a path in a forest or a jungle and to survive. And when you're out in the wild, walking down a path, things happen. You see a bunch of coyotes. You're like, oh, crap, a bunch of coyotes. Are they coming towards me? What am I going to do? How can I defend myself? Should I run? Should I climb a tree? And so you have to very quickly get your act together and do something. And that's a giant ramping up of neuronal activity and muscular activity. And the point I'm making is in your neurons, they have to very quickly go the equivalent of going from zero to 60 miles per hour, 70 miles, 100 miles per hour. And when that happens, the neurons have a mechanism to do this. The endoplasmic reticulum is a storage site, a reservoir of calcium. 
And when you look at a book, they'll just show you the endoplasmic reticulum, you're looking like an amoeba drawn in the corner of the cell, but it's not like that in real life. In real life, it's like all over the cell and it's got these pseudopod projections from it that are all over the place touching things. And they touch the mitochondria. And these are actually called MAMs, mitochondrial associated membranes. And they have calcium connecting points whereby when you have a sudden ramping up of activity, the neuron's gonna need to make lots more ATP fast. What they do is they ship calcium into the mitochondrial matrix because in this context, it will cause upregulation and increase in the uh, Krebs cycle enzymes so that the Krebs cycle can run a lot faster. And normally insulin resistance wasn't an issue. And because of that, it was relatively easy to get glucose into the cell and you could then start making a lot more energy. But here's where the problem occurs. In the modern person with insulin resistance, because you can't get these glucose type four transporters up to the plasma membrane of the neuron, you can't get glucose in. But it appears that these are not intelligently coupled because this wasn't anticipated by our ancestors who were worried about starving. So the endoplasmic reticulum in this context, a sudden stress and needing to ramp up metabolic activity, it just keeps pumping calcium into the mitochondrial matrix. But with the insulin resistance, not enough glucose is coming through. So the success of calcium being dumped into the mitochondrial matrix, that can damage the mitochondria, cause them uh, to fail and to die. And when you lose your mitochondria, you're often soon after going to lose the cell and it goes into apoptosis. So that's another reason why the diabetic's not going to handle well a sudden stressful event and cognitive challenge. Um, so that's another mechanism of causing dementia. A lot of diabetics are overweight and also have obstructive sleep apnea. They can undergo sleep studies and you put a pulse ox on their finger, you can see where their O2 sats are at night. I've seen some of them dropping their O2 sats into the 60s. Um, so if you're not getting enough glucose and oxygen in your brain, you know, like a Del Torre theory, it's like a mouse equivalent, not good. Okay, and here's a chronic problem that goes on all day long. First of all, here's a normal artery. A normal artery, and this is actually like a little capillary. You've got the, the red blood cells have to deform themselves to pass through a capillary because the red blood cell is about seven microns. That's worth knowing. Capillary is about five microns in diameter. So it has to fold back on itself to pass through the capillary. And this is the red blood cell folded back on itself. These spindle-shaped cells are endothelial cells. That's their nucleus. So the red blood cells come in here with the arrow, and then they exit out the other side of the capillary. These rectangular green cells are the vascular smooth muscle cells. This yellow right here is the basement membrane of the capillary, for example. So when the red blood cell releases its oxygen, these little blue circles, they have to pass through the capillary wall and they have to then travel to the neuron to provide oxygen to it. Well, with diabetes, you get marked thickening of this uh, basement membrane and it gets glycated. You get hypertrophy and hypertension of the vascular smooth muscle. You get increased number of the cells and they get enlarged. And you also lay down more collagen. So the point I'm saying is it's becoming less able to deliver oxygen to the tissue. So you can see how multiple things are adding up in a bad direction. They're breaking bad in a bad direction where less oxygen is able to be delivered to the tissue. And so then if you take this baseline damage to the arterial wall and you superimpose upon it, a high fat meal sticking all these red blood cells together, you're going to drop oxygen and glucose delivery another 15 to 20%. Roy Swank, the multiple sclerosis expert, friends with Dr. McDougall, he measured in a hamster brain after feeding a high-fat meal, he would sometimes get 30% reduction in the oxygen delivery to the tissues. And you add dietary sodium, vasoconstriction, you're going to get less uh, oxygen uh, being able to be delivered to the tissues. And you see how this all adds up. And that's what I meant too. When you start then adding stimulants, you know, you add caffeine on board, you add tobacco, you add amphetamine or whatever else is a stimulant, sleep deprivation, psychological stress, intense emotions or whatever, chronic unabating psychological stress, you're ramping up the metabolic activity of that neuron simultaneously dropping the oxygen and glucose delivery. <clears throat> there comes a time when that neuron just can't handle it anymore and it goes into programmed cell death called apoptosis. Apoptosis means like the falling off of a leaf in Greek. And it's when the cell dies slowly so it recycles itself and its internal chemicals can be sent to other neurons. But you keep on losing brain cells like that and you end up demented. Okay, also when you eat, when you, whenever you hear all this stuff about microbiome, you should really think about two things. There's good bacteria and bad bacteria. Keep it simple. And basically the good bacteria feed on fiber. That's what gives you good gut bacteria. And that's the main thing to protect your intestinal uh, uh, lining cells, make your tight junctions. When you don't eat fiber, because there's no fiber in meat and there's very little in processed food, then you start getting a proliferation of the bad gut bacteria. And the bad gut bacteria have more of this enzyme called glucuronidase. 
normally our body excretes estrogen through the liver. It's then pumped into the bile and that goes through when we eat, it then passes into our succus enterocus, our intestinal fluids, and we defecate it out of our body. That's how we lower our estrogen levels. But if you have an excess of these bad gut bacteria, they will use this glucuronidase enzyme, enzyme to deconjugate. So conjugation means the estrogen, E for estrogen, is bound to a glucuronic acid. Just think of that as being like a glucose with a carboxylic acid on it. That's an oversimplification, but it's good enough for our purposes. So the point is when you deconjugate these because you've got the bad gut bacteria because you have a lack of dietary fiber, you then will reabsorb the estrogen back in your blood. And you have high blood estrogen levels, you're predisposed to obesity, fibroid tumors of the uterus, increased breast cancer, et cetera. And, you know, like I said, obesity, diabetes, and all that stuff. Okay. Increased dietary salt contributes to uh, insulin resistance and diabetes. You know, it gets you to eat more, just like the more free glutamate gets you to eat more, which predisposes you to becoming fat. Um, plus it's a vasoconstrictor there. Okay, these are just more papers uh, saying the same thing. Oh, if you're cooking on these nonstick cookware, according to these authors, they feel that that becomes toxic, toxic to the pancreas beta cells. So that will contribute to uh, increased risk of diabetes. Um, endocrine disruptors, uh, many of those are also uh, increasing your risk of diabetes. Okay, here it says the ones in plastics alter beta cell physiology, increase risk of diabetes. Okay, and we talked before, I'm not a big fan. I know soy gets hyped by everybody. I, I think it's totally overrated. It's very high in glutamate. It's very estrogenic. And I jokingly said before, you know, this lady right here, it's pretty obvious to me why she's got high estrogen. She's got breasts. She got a Virginia. Okay. I don't see any breasts or Virginia on the soy plant. And I think that it uses that soy to make whatever animal eats it infertile. Um, and it's also goitrogenic. All right. And then flax is off the chart estrogen, far, far more than soy. Soy is, you know, like thousands of times more than most other foods. And then flax is far more than soy. So I'm not a big fan of, of like, I don't see the need to go seeking out estrogenic fat. Because I know like you look at all these blue zone, you know, the National Geographic Dan Butner populations. I don't recall hearing them. They went out into the woods and looked for, you know, flax. They needed more estrogenic fat. I don't recall hearing that. All right, atrazine, the stuff that's sprayed on the non-organic corn, that's a super powerful um, uh, estrogenic chemical. It turns the male frogs into female frogs. And the guy who figured that out, Tyrone Hayes, okay, what happens to him? Does he get a big celebration when he figures it out? No, they try to fire him, take away his grant money. And so that's a punishment for telling the truth about a profitable corporate food, okay? Um, and it's also a mitochondrial inhibitor, great. Something that makes you fat. It feminizes you for a guy. And, and on top of it, it inhibits your mitochondria. Oh, gee, I really want to eat that. And then high fructose corn syrup is made out of that. And then they'll filter it, let's say, through a chloralkali vat, and that adds mercury to it. And they used to advertise that as a benefit. They go, oh, it's a good preservative. Yeah, because mercury is so toxic. Okay, and here's this really smart guy. He's done a lot of research on, um, on sort of like uh, black phosphate sprayed on soy and stuff and other endocrine disrupting chemicals. And anyways, he says that these EDCs, endocrine disrupting chemicals should be renamed to EDNDs, that they're also, besides being endocrine disruptors, they're also neuronal disruptors. He said 80% of them were toxic to neurons. In addition, 20% of them were toxic to the thyroid. So that means they could be make you hypothyroid, be goitrogenic. So you wanna avoid all this stuff. And I've actually come to the conclusion, the only way to win this game is to just avoid all the processed foods. Okay, aluminum, which is very common in um, all your tap water, if you don't uh, filter that out. Um, it's also, you know, I, would, I wouldn't ever put my food on aluminum foil for this reason as well. Sometimes this is sprayed in the air in the you-know-what type of trails. Um, I would try to avoid all that as best I could. Um, I would never eat food cooked on aluminum. Um, and they're showing here that that also can be toxic to pancreatic beta cells, cause beta cell necrosis. Great. Okay, now here's a guy that's interesting to know about, Tetsumori Yamashima, Japanese neuroscientist. And he's the one who did all this work on the omega-6 cooking oils. He did a lot of work in monkeys. And he was shown that it's toxic to the pancreas beta cells. It's also toxic to the hippocampal brain cells, toxic to the hypothalamus brain cells. So let's say here's an omega-6 cooking oil. And what this means is here's a fatty acid. It's a PUFA. PUFA means polyunsaturated fatty acid. So unsaturates means double bonds. All right, and fatty acid is carboxylic acid at one side, then a long chain of carbons. All these little angles are carbons. You count from this end, this is called the methyl end, this is the carboxyl end. 
And it's also called the omega n is carbon one, carbon two, three, four, five, six. Because that's carbon six, this is an omega six fat. And then there's usually another double bond, you know, just one carbon away. So the carbon in between, like a carbon bound to two hydrogens, as this is right here, is called a methylene carbon or a methylene bridge between the double bonds. It has only a loose hold on its electro on its on its hydrogen because these double bonds are sort of pulling on the electrons in this context, and this hydrogen will get plucked off. Oops, I meant to go back. Um, all right, so this hydrogen will get plucked off. Now you got a free radical, unpaired electron in the outer orbital. And then oxygen will bind to that. Two oxygens in a row bound to this molecule. That's called a peroxidize, a peroxide. So you started with a lipid and now you've got a peroxide. So this is called lipid peroxidation. And this initiates a chain reaction where it'll now react with whatever's next to it. Like let's say another phospholipid in your plasma membrane and it'll progressively destroy the membrane. Um, you can have antioxidants can neutralize this. And antioxidants usually a big molecule that can donate an electron to sort of quell this fire, you know, give it an octet of uh, paired electrons in its outer orbital. And an antioxidant is so big that it can handle donating an electron and not become hyperreactive itself. That's things like vitamin C, vitamin E, for example, glutathione. Okay, so anyways, when you eat omega-6 cooking oils, the more double bonds you have, the more prone you are to this lipid peroxidation. Okay, we talked about hydroxy nonanol a little while ago. We talked about hydroxy nonanol. HNE also inhibits uh, ATP synthase. It's a real toxic thing, this uh, HNE. Okay, um, Tetsumori's theory is sort of for brain damage is officially called the calpane uh theory of neurodegeneration. And the way this works is that when you have elevated hydroxy nonanol, it'll go into your neurons and it'll bind something called HSP. HSP stands for heat shock uh, protein. And your heat shock proteins, they have two important jobs in a neuron. They will carry uh, your dysfunctional protons as like a chaperone. They will deliver these dysfunctional proteins to the lysosome. The lysosome is sort of like this recycling uh, center. Um, it'll take the proteins, break them up into their individual amino acids, and then can recycle them. The heat shock proteins also stabilize the lysosomal membrane and prevent it from breaking down. Um, there's very powerful enzymes in there like cathepsin protease for breaking apart proteins. And the point I'm saying is when HNE is present in high amounts, it'll bind to HSP, the heat shock protein. And for some reason that just makes it attracted to calpane. Then calpane will cut the HSP, the heat shock protein. So now it can't do its job anymore. It can no longer chaperone defective proteins and it can no longer maintain the integrity of the membrane around the lysosome. When that happens, the lysosome then leaks these digestive enzymes like cathepsin, and they just go around the cell destroying the proteins and the cell dies, okay? Uh, so that's bad. And this is just some slides from uh, Tetsumori Yamashima's paper. And he's like the editor of one of these dementia journals, very bright guy. I think he's MD, PhD actually. Okay, so this is showing neurons in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, that's the hunger center and they're just being destroyed, okay? These are the dead neurons. The, so here you have a normal intact nucleus, and here it is just sort of dissolved, and it's fading away. And this happens gradually over the course of decades. The more neurons you lose in your uh, hunger center, the less skilled you're going to be at being able to control your appetite. Um, in addition, this was a relatively severe problem in the hippocampus, your memory center, okay? That's going to make you demented. So according to Tetsumori Yamashima, he says increased intake of omega-6 cooking oils is, in his opinion, the most important reason why there's a dramatic increase in the amount of dementia in Japan. And he says it's because they're allowed their diet to be more westernized with these cooking oils. And it's causing a lot of Japanese people to get diabetes and to become demented. So these are just hippocampal uh, CA1 sector. That's cornua amnos uh, type one sector. And again, more you know intact neuron here with a nucleus there and a well-formed cell body. And you can see the plasma membrane around it. And here you see them just sort of dissolving, being destroyed, dead neurons. Okay, so, you know, same old story. The way, if you eat the SAD diet, the standard American diet, you're really going to have lots of fat, end up with atherosclerosis, high risk of hypertension, diabetes, cognitively impaired, lots of cancer, lots of impotence, things you don't want, lots of stroke. Uh, the East Asian diet used to be like, let's say the Japan diet in the 1960s. Uh, what got them in trouble is a very high sodium and they're smoking a lot of cigarettes, but they compensated well for it because they were low in fat because they're eating tons of white rice. 
and they didn't get hardly any diabetes despite that. They would get hypertension though from the sodium and the smoking, and that led to a lot of strokes, but they still were relatively healthy despite that. South Asian is like in India. And in India, I used to think everybody from India was healthy because I got lots of friends and they're vegetarians and they're skinny, but it turns out they got a lot of diabetes. And I think it's primarily from the Tetsumori Yamashima theory that they eat a lot of fried food and that's causing lipid peroxidation, damaging their pancreatic beta cells. That's why they have high diabetes. I think that's it. And it's almost like a type 1.5 diabetes where they have where they get diabetes as an adult, but they're still kind of skinny because they're rapidly losing their uh, pancreas beta cells. And then here's low-fat, low-sodium vegan. You, you're, you'll like virtually never get type 2 diabetes if you're long-standing low-fat vegan. You'll virtually never get hypertension. In communities where they eat this way for life, they have the same blood pressure in their 70s as they do as children, as babies almost. They maybe go up about 10 points from baby time, if at all. Very low myocardial infarction, and very low incidence of cancer. So it's obviously the best way to go. This is what I call my version of it, the Spartan vegan diet. Am I doing okay for time? I don't know where I'm at. Okay, just real simple. Yeah, Dr. Rogers, you're fine. You're fine, Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Um, starches are the best foods. Potatoes, sweet potatoes and rice, white rice, they all got 1% fat. You eat that, you're probably going to be skinny. <clears throat> That'll help you get your diabetes under control. That's what I would do. Um, if you had to pick a bean, I would go with the lentils. Lentils are only about 3% fat. So that's the lowest fat of the beans. When you eat like black beans are in the ballpark, 4% fat. Garbanzos are about 13, which is still pretty low fat, but it's you know higher compared to the other beans. Uh, if you look at some food like animal foods, forget it. Salmon, everybody's going to tell you fish is good. No, I think you should never eat fish. But just to give you an example, salmon, 50% uh, fat, 50% protein. That's way, way, way too high. You really want your total dietary fat. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'd probably try to keep it below 10%. Some people say below 15%. Um, if you just avoid all the animal foods and you avoid real high fat plant foods, You'll, you'll have it down there. Like I said, Kempner got, a, what was it, what I showed that slide was in the ballpark of like 2%, all right? And Pritikin went through all the literature on, on fats and there were studies where they kept the population to less than 1% fat, 0.75% fat. And the patients did fine with that. Um, all right, so what else? So starches are the best thing because they satisfy your hunger, like we talked about. These are other good starches. Oatmeal, that's probably in the ballpark of 16% fat. Quinoa is something similar, but that's still much, much better than these animal foods. Um, let's see. I like, if I'm going to eat oatmeal or quinoa, I like those for breakfast or lunch just because they're kind of wet and you don't want, I don't like to eat really wet foods at night. Cause then I have to wake up the void more. Oh, I figured out a new trick, uh, how not to have to, uh, pee so much at night. And here's what my trick is. If I put the thermostat up real hot, cause then you sweat a little bit, you just need to you avoid less. Okay. So if you got a big prostate or a guy getting older, that can be a useful trick. The only problem is you got to get your family to agree with that. So you might have to like sleep in a different part of the house in order to get them to let you do that. Cause otherwise they get ticked off about that. A lot of people, especially if they're meat eaters and they're overweight and stuff. Um, okay. So what else? Fruits, fruits are great. You know, like I said, if you don't overdo it, cause if you overdo it, I think you can get fat from them, but we already talked about it. Younger people who exercise a lot, don't have a problem and eat tons of them. And they're skinny. Like I showed you, you know, the marathon runner, et cetera, the bicycle racer. Okay. Um, veggies are good, but they don't have enough calories. You can't satisfy your hunger with veggies. Um, vitamin B12, you probably end up having to take a B12. I just take methylcobalamin. Okay. I like methylcobalamin. I don't want cyano. I would never take cyano. I'd be worried about that accumulating. You know what that means, don't you? Okay. So anyways, and these other psychological things are important, you know, maintain your, your relationships with your family, your friends, your coworkers, get your exercise. Exercise is great for improving insulin sensitivity. Get your sunshine, make sure you get your sleep, try to go to bed earlier. That's the main thing with that. People who are religious are a lot healthier. Everybody, nobody talks about that anymore, but that has a major contribution. Look at all the blue zones. Okay. Here's just an example of a plate with a Spartan vegan diet. Spartan vegan is just my version, you know, Spartan because it's kind of simple and sparse and Spartan also because I used to be a wrestler in college and whatnot. Also, you want to make sure you filter your water to get all those estrogenic chemicals out of them. There's tons of estrogenic chemicals in water, including birth control pills. It's too expensive for municipal water filtration to remove all these estrogenic chemicals from water. And they're easy to remove. All you need is a carbon filter, okay? And there's tons of these estrogenic chemicals. So I think that's a big part of why people say, well, I'm trying to eat pretty good, but I just don't seem to lose the weight. Well, you know, reduce your estrogenic chemical exposure. That might help. I think there's a good chance it would. Uh, let's see what else. We talked about your starches here get some greens and then have some fruits. And again, the more you're worried about your weight, I would probably reduce the fruits, especially if you're, if you're older and you're quite overweight. Um, and fruits, the catch with fruits is they're kind of expensive. 
They're more difficult to store unless you freeze them. So they're a little bit of a challenge. Oh, and what is health about? I think it's a little bit like these video games. So here, for example, is like a Super Mario Brothers video game. And so in a typical video game, the character runs through the obstacle course and there's certain things where they gain energy points and then there's certain things where they lose energy points. And that's what learning about health is like, you know, avoid the mitochondrial inhibitor because the mitochondrial inhibitors take away your energy points, you know, eat the low fat, low sodium plant-based diet, get your sleep, your sunshine, maintain some good relationships. Those increase your energy points. And you want to learn all this stuff because you're pretty much on your own. As I just showed you before, conventional medicine is good. It's a lot of high tech things. The emergency room saves a lot of people's lives. And it's good at diagnosing some rare things, treating some rare things. But for most of the things that make everybody fat, sick, and stupid and cause them to die, conventional medicine doesn't work, okay? By definition, the reason they call these diseases chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, is because they can't cure them ever, zero, never, okay? So don't expect them to save you with a pill. There is no quick fix, okay? And the other thing is, is you're not gonna have just one answer. You, it's like, you know, the last straw that broke the camel's back. All of these things are piling up from the poor diet, the lack of sleep, the excessive psychological stress, all these toxins and all these processed foods. So you really want to just learn about them and avoid them as best you can. Maintain your reserve as best you can. Um, I've given other previous lectures, like my last lecture um, with Chef AJ on how to uh, prevent dementia. I went through all of this stuff here. Um, and I, in my other lectures on Chef AJ's channel, I've gone through um, is organic worthwhile to eat? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, what causes insulin resistance? We talked about it. All fats in general increase insulin resistance, including, you know, the beloved olive oil. Um, but saturated fats, the worst, the most acute of them. Omega-6 not only causes insulin resistance, it'll actually damage your beta uh, cells directly, like we talked about the Yamashima theory. We talked about how sodium vasoconstriction, increased uric acid from high fructose corn syrup, um, will contribute to insulin resistance. We talked about how having the free glutamate uh, gets you more addicted to food, so you'll overeat uh, things that you shouldn't be eating. Animal protein is kind of tricky. We learned this from T. Colin Campbell, how it was causing elevated blood cap cholesterol, and it appears that it induces an anabolic uh, state into the body um, and that it causes some activation of mTOR. And so the body sort of ramped up and that will increase your blood lipids. Psychological stress increases your blood lipids. Um, alcohol has a tendency to lead to fatty liver. Um, we talked about high fructose corn syrup in particular is can cause fatty liver. And then all these mitochondrial toxins are going to decrease the energy production of your mitochondria and potentially contribute to this whole reversal of electron transport leading to increased vulnerability to insulin resistance. Get the, get away from these estrogenic chemicals if you can, as much as you can. Um, get your exercise because that has the same effect as insulin in the sense that it moves the glucose type four transporters up to the plasma membrane in the skeletal muscle. So that increases insulin sensitivity. Um, <clears throat> I recommend try not to be iron overloaded because that can have a synergistically bad uh, oxidative stress contributing to um, uh, your insulin problems. And I also recommend like, be careful about taking a multivitamin where you don't know what's in it. A lot of times there'll be things in there you don't want. You got to watch out for like being overloaded in copper. Copper can cause some similar problems as iron overloaded, increased oxidative stress. Um, circa inhibitors, anything that smells bad, there's a good chance it's a circuit inhibitor. I, I talked about that in the previous dementia lecture, but anything that's going to lower mitochondrial function is bad. Uh, one point I wanted to make about some common foods here is that like here's salmon, 50-50, easy. 50% 50 fat, 50% protein. That's terrible. Way too high in fat, way too high in protein. I would never eat that. Okay, look at oil. Oil is liquid fat. It's the highest caloric density possible food. I would never eat oil. I would never eat anything with oil in it, okay? And I'm not a big fan of nuts. I see nuts the way Elselson does, no nuts. They've got tons of fats. They're like a lot of times, you know, 80 to 90% fat. Look at this, 86% fat. You really want all that fat? You know, and I know some people think that nuts are like magic. Well, it comes from nuts. Maybe it's not so bad, okay? But it's still too much fat in my opinion. I would avoid it. Okay, soybeans are also quite fat. You know, depending on the paper you read, 39%, 40%, 42% fat. That's a lot of fat. I wouldn't eat them. I would never eat anything with soy in it, just so you know. And I don't think it's a good food. I know it gets all this publicity, but if you go back to the papers around 1980, 1985, less and less grants were given to the scientists and more and more the big food companies and the big um, drug companies were funding the research study. And the scientists are poor. They're desperate for money, okay? So they have to do whatever the corporation tells them. So you're, you get all these 
you know, papers that say all these commercial foods are so wonderful, but you go back to the old stuff and you'll see paper after paper showing problems with these popular foods, these, these oils, these uh, soy, this caffeine and all this stuff. And so I would recommend avoiding it. And I'll tell you, it's really educational. Read through Pritikin, okay? You'd be amazed. That guy was a genius. Pritikin's legacy book is also at McDougal's website. Read through that. And you're like, you know what? You know what Pritikin said? Pritikin said, all Americans, virtually all Americans are diabetic. And you go, what are you talking about? Lots of them, you know, do okay on the oral glucose tolerance test. He says, test them after dinner, after they've eaten a high fat dinner. And you will find that almost all Americans fail the oral glucose tolerance test from all the fat they eat with their dinners. But that was pretty clever. And Pritikin said, fat is bad. He came to that conclusion. You want to minimize your dietary fat as best you can. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this just shows the plant foods tend to be quite low in uh, fat. And, you know, potatoes, sweet potatoes, white rice, only 1% fat. You know, you eat a lot of that. That's going to make you skinny. Okay. Also, these foods tend to have reasonable amounts of omega-3s. You can get a reasonable amount of omega-3s uh, from eating plant foods. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> we talked about avoid all the oils. Um, eat your starches, get your exercise and all the things that make you healthy. Sweet potatoes, I think are just about the healthiest food in the world because they're only about four and a half percent protein. I actually think the goal should be to reduce dietary protein. Um, you want to minimize, there was a guy named Mitchell and he kind of mimicked the, Essel, the I'm sorry, the uh, Kempner diet in some ways. And he came to the conclusion from a lot of animal research that the more you lower protein, the longer the animal lives. Um, and maybe that's because the protein sort of is activating mTOR and speeding up arrival at the hay flick limit, especially animal protein, much more so than plant protein. And T. Colin Campbell talked about that as well. But Mitchell said it's not just it's not just uh, animal protein. In his opinion, he thought reducing all protein was beneficial. So that's that's kind of a topic for another day. We don't want to get into all that. But I'm just saying, I think it's a good idea to reduce the protein. Then other people say, well, what about all these papers show that you have sarcopenia, weakness, lack of muscle development in the old people, and they need to eat more protein. I personally don't, don't think that's correct. I eat a low protein diet, probably about 10% protein. I'm 60. I just did. I just had a contest with these young guys they are making fun of me. And uh, I could only do 48 pushups at the time, but I got up to 78 pushups in a set. With good form, really, I can only do 64. But what I'm trying to say is, my strength is just fine. Okay. I'm 60. And, and, and that's the case. All these blue zone people, they're not seeking out protein supplements. All those protein supplements got tons of manufactured free, you know, glutamate. And they also often are contaminated. Look at, uh, if you type in the consumer reports article on protein powders, you'll see lots of them have contaminants in them and they increase the risk according to consumer reports of uh, kidney failure and whatnot. And I've seen a bunch of young guys in kidney failure from taking too much of these protein supplements. You don't want it. Uh, so anyways, I hope that was helpful as ideas on how to lose weight. And again, I say you want to live like Adam and Eve, but keep your indoor heating and plumbing. Be kind of simple. Eat naturally occurring whole foods that are out there in the world. The whole foods, they're not going to have all this processed glutamine off the charts, uh, making you overeat, making you addicted to things you shouldn't be addicted to. And uh, so anyways, I hope that was helpful. That's it. Yeah, uh, Dr. Rogers, that was really interesting. I took a bunch of notes and I'd like to ask you a few questions if you don't mind. And also some people wrote in some questions in advance, not necessarily on this topic, but if you don't mind, I'd like to ask those as well. Sure, sure. Okay, so one of the things that I thought was really interesting that you said, and I wasn't aware of this, you said that diabetics generally die of heart disease. Why is that? Do they have heart disease as a result of diabetes? Do they have them both at the same time? Yeah, well, it contributes to causing atherosclerosis. And the other thing, too, is when we talk about coronary artery disease, there's a tendency, because everyone is aware of stents and bypass, to think only of the epicardial coronary arteries. So imagine this was a heart here, okay, this, this thing right here. And my fingers on top of it would be like the epicardial coronary arteries. And in the proximal parts of them, you can get a cath in there, you can place a stent, you can surgically bypass across a narrow, and we call them a stenosis in medicine. But what I'm saying is, all of that muscle, like imagine this is the muscle here. If you look at it, I'll open this up here. There's tons of arteries that go into all this muscle. You can't get a balloon in there. You can't get a stent in there. The only way you could treat that is with diet or with a medication. And these things are all plugging up. And so these microvascular areas here, and that's why people can also have a heart attack, congestive heart failure, but have a clean cardiac cath because they don't have any large vessel artery disease. They got microvascular angina, it's called. And what I'm saying is the only way to reverse that is to manage your diet or take a pill. And that can cause pretty severe coronary artery disease. Um, so, and it's diffused. There was a guy named William Roberts. 
he's a cardiac pathologist. He did like over 2000 autopsies on myocardial infarction patients. And he said, this idea of single vessel coronary disease is a myth. He says, it's always diffuse. It's always everywhere of similar severity. So you, you could never successfully treat it long-term with just a stent or just a bypass because it's always in all the vessels. Did I answer the question there or was there more to it? But yeah, so I'm just curious because my brother was diabetic and he had heart disease and he ended up dying of pancreatic cancer. He was a physician, but I, I never knew what came first, the heart disease or the diabetes or they occurred concurrently. Yeah, I think a lot of times the diabetes is contributing to it because I think that, you know, if you look at cancer, a lot of times there's more than one theory. And I think uh, Otto Warburg's theories was better. And his theory was just that when you make the tissue ischemia, ischemic, meaning having lack of oxygen, you tend to injure the mitochondria because they can't run electron transport without that oxygen to receive the electrons at the end. So he says many cells will die gradually by apoptosis or they will transform themselves into running anaerobically, like it's a reactivation of an evolutionary uh, pathway. In the early origin of the world, there wasn't that much oxygen and the cell might have to go back and forth between oxygen metabolism, which makes lots of energy or anaerobic metabolism on glycolysis, which doesn't make much energy. But the point was, when those cells transform, you can get cancer. So what I'm saying is you're going to have a lot of ischemia all over the body if you're diabetic and some cells might transform to cancer. You're also going to be immunocompromised and immunocompromised cells, they, the way you prevent cancer is because your immune system removes the cancer cells. So you're immunocompromised with diabetes and you're oxygen deprived. That's a setup for cancer. And oh, one more thing too, Shulman, this researcher, he says, he thinks that obesity related cancer is really primarily uh, insulin resistance related cancer. So he thinks you really want to get down your insulin resistance. And that also brings up the point that this ketogenic diet for, for diabetes is stupid because it's going to cause a lot of insulin resistance. It's going to be causing tissue hypoxia. And this insulin resistance is going to lead to these secondary complications. So I think it's a bad idea. Thank you. And one of the things you said, because we, we, you know, I, People have different diets and I respect them. I mean, hopefully they're some form of a vegan diet, but you had mentioned something that a couple of times that I agree with about how fruit as healthy as it is, is much more expensive than starches and that it doesn't have the satiety. And so many people want to know, is a raw diet healthier? And I'm curious what your thoughts on that, because some people seem to be able to do it successfully, but I don't find fruit satisfying no matter how much I eat. Even if it's dried fruit, I just never feel full on fruit. Yeah, I've had a problem myself with fruit is that I can't stop eating it. And mm -hmm. like with my starch, I go, oh, I'm getting kind of full time to stop. And I don't want any more. You, you, you wouldn't get me to, to have any more. Okay, but it's not like that with fruits. Fruits, I can just keep going and going. Like I said, I would find myself eating five apples, 10 apples, 15 apples. I'm like, whoa, I shouldn't eat so many. Okay, and the same thing would happen with blueberries. I would eat 32 ounces, 48 ounces, 64 ounces, and I would still be fine to eat more. They don't satisfy hunger, so you can just keep eating them. And that's why I think there might be some truth to that idea of Richard Johnson saying it's a way that um, an animal can fatten itself up for hibernation, all right? And then I know people will contradict that. They're going to show you, you know, all these skinny... Uh, long distance uh, triathletes and marathoners and stuff, but they're relatively young people with high metabolic rates that are exercising a tremendous amount. I think a person can become fat if they just keep overeating something that doesn't satisfy their hunger. So that's why I, 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 it's a nuanced thing. And it's obviously much worse with high fructose corn syrup where there's no fiber and there's no potassium and there's no magnesium and no vitamin C, et cetera. But it's still, I think, yeah, there is a, a potential risk with eating for too much fruits. But how do you, uh, you know, answer people that say that, you know, we weren't meant to cook our food and we, that, you know, oh. we're, we're supposed to be frugivores or fruitarians. Yeah. And th there is something to those arguments in the sense that I think that's why we have color vision. And so we can see when a fruit is ripe. But I think in the wild, unless you're in a tropical area, a lot of times fruits are not available all year round. Okay. So that's one potential problem. And, um, you know, then you go back to McDougall did a lot of work on early diets and he believes we ate starch right from the beginning. Other people say, well, we probably didn't have fire available at the beginning. So how could we have eaten starch if we couldn't cook? Um, and in my experience, usually when I try to double check McDougall, he ends up being right because I've double checked him numerous times and he's always ended up being right. But I haven't double checked him on that one. But I would assume based on having double checked him on lots of other things, he's probably right. But I don't know for sure. Do you think if somebody has a disease like cancer, an all raw or a high raw diet in that case might be more beneficial? 
It might. I, I don't know for sure, but I do know there's some people who've written that. You know, for example, that Janet Murray lady, she had metastatic breast cancer and she went on all raw diet. She wrote a book, Raw Cures Cancer. Okay. And she's pretty impressive Australian lady. Her husband was also a marathon runner. She, and this is all, the other thing I've noticed too. And Ruth Hydra said some similar things. They have incredible recovery. She ran a marathon every single day around the perimeter of Australia. So 365 marathons in a year. That's incredible. Normal person run a marathon. They can't do anything for two weeks. Okay. She's running another marathon every day. Um, so that's, yeah, it was raw cures cancer. And that was, uh, I think Janet Murray. You know what I'd like to know? And I don't think this has necessarily ever been studied or could be studied because obviously if somebody has cancer, they're going to do what they need to do as soon as possible. But the people that have been cured or benefited from doing all raw with cancer, were they on the diet that you and Dr. McDougall or Dr. Esselstyn recommend first? Do you, you understand what I'm saying? Right, they, right. Or see, see, because I believe that when you take off the bad stuff, which is the animal products and processed food, you can heal quite a bit without necessarily having to be 100% raw. And I'm not talking about people that say they feel better raw, but I want people to know that you the diet you're recommending can still be very healing. I'd like to know if there's somebody that is a healthy vegan that's been eating a whole food plant exclusive diet that's low in fat and free of sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt, and caffeine that then got cancer and then they adopted a raw diet and, and cured it. I, 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 do those people exist? A couple of things come to mind. Like one will be Ruth Hydrich. She had metastatic breast cancer diagnosed at about 42 years of age. She's still alive now in her eighties. And the reason I mention is Excuse me. She initially went on the McDougal diet, starch-based diet. She said that she became a vegan within two hours of talking to Dr. McDougal. She didn't need anything more than that because she knew it was her chance to live longer. She didn't want to go on the, the, the chemo path. All right. So, and then she said, though, as, as she got older, though, she found it more convenient to eat a raw uh, vegan diet, though. So she's been managing to do that. Um, and if you look at also like a T. Colin Campbell's research in China, the plant-based Chinese who were eating, you know, especially white rice is the main source of calories, which is going to be very low fat, but it's a starch, it's cooked. They had a dramatically reduced incidence of, um, of cancer. And even Pritikin said by eating a low fat diet, according to Nathan Pritikin, he said, there's two types of diet. There's high fat and low fat diets. He says, those are the main dietary categories. And he says, people who eat low fat diets, they reduce their risk of cancer by 90%, which is a pretty dramatic reduction. Um, and based on the Warburg theory, given that fat tends to make tissue ischemic, especially if you add salt to it, um, avoiding those things, you should dramatically lower your risk of running into that problem of having hypoxic tissue. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. One of the ingredients that a lot of people that eat plants uh, eat, and not so much maybe the people that are raw, but I'm not sure I've heard you talk about it, is nutritional yeast. How do you feel about that? Well, that sounds to me like you're heading down that path of the yeast fermenting the proteins and you ending up with a lot of free glutamate. But, and also just to, just to let you know, I haven't studied that topic as much as I wanted, but I am interested in it too, that idea of how much raw is good. There's just one last guy I would mention. There was a guy named Nick Martinez and he was pretty famous. And I don't necessarily agree with all his dietary advice, but what I'm trying to say is there's not just a few people. There's a lot of people who think there's a benefit to going raw, but I don't know enough about it yet to, to speak confidently. So I want to wait till a future time when I've studied that in more detail. Uh, but there's some promise in it. Okay. And then, and then your last question a moment ago. Oh, um, you mean the one about nutritional yeast or? Yeah. 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 One about nutritional yeast yeah. is. What do you think? It, I, I'm guessing you personally don't consume it. No, I don't. I don't consume anything fancy. The Spartan vegans actually what I actually eat. I'm really simple. Um, I actually think that's one of my strengths, but at the same time, it makes me boring. Uh, but what I've ever I've read about nutritional yeast is it, it tends to be associated with increased free glutamine. I think it ferments whatever it's associated with somehow. Uh, so I, I, I see no reason for it. And I'm not that fancy. And I think there was a joke too that um, Pritikin was kind of like that. When I read Pritikin, I feel like I'm talking to myself that he was real simple in all his foods. It's sort of like, I just want to eat fast do whatever I'm doing and get back to what I'm doing. I don't, I, so I'm not that fancy a, a cook or whatever. So I know lots of people that are real interested in all that stuff and that's great, but you know, I'm pretty simple. Yeah. You know, I, I would like to personally eat it, but it gives me such terrible stomach pain. So ha have you ever had it, Dr. Rogers, or you've never even tried it? Not that I'm aware of. And, and yeah, I, so I wouldn't know about it. I'm just curious. We get a lot of questions about it. When you were showing the images of the brain, you're an interventional neuro uh, 
radiologists, you were saying, you know, you, you showed some of them in like an 80, 85 year old brain, but you're saying you're starting to see that in younger and younger patients. Oh yeah. And I'm wondering when you see that, because you're, I'm guessing you're typically the kind of doctor that people don't come to regularly. And even though you'd be a wonderful lifestyle medicine doctor, they probably only have one appointment with you. Do you ever have an opportunity to tell them what you see on the scans and how dietary and lifestyle change could maybe help them? I would love to do all that. I often talk to my my uh, my patients and a lot of people come seek me out and a lot of people send me emails asking me stuff, but there's there's no, there's almost no money in this diet and lifestyle coaching and stuff. I wish there was. I would love, I've had enough of conventional medicine. I was an imaging guidance surgeon when I first came out and then I gradually transitioned to becoming mostly a neuroradiologist. I had trained in interventional endovascular neuroradiology, but that's getting taken over by neurosurgery. Uh, so anyways, I would love to do more, you know, doctor patient consultation and spend more time talking to patients, but the way medicine works, it's like a giant factory assembly line. And the, what they want a doctor to do is generate billable, uh, codes to call them billing codes, you know, CPT codes. And so the doctors are typically put in a location where they can generate as many billing codes as fast as possible. And no one really cares about the patients. I hate to say that, but that is true. What I mean by that is as long as the standard of care is provided, whatever it is for the given thing, the doctors get paid and they can't be sued. And that's what matters. And that's what generates billables. And at the end of the day, there's going to be some bean counter that looks at your progress. And they're going to want to know, did you generate as many beans as the other doctors in your area? Okay. And they're always going to press them to go faster. So what I'm trying to say is, I would love, I wish there was a research institute. I wish there was a telehealth place where I could, I would take a 50% salary cut to do this if I could for a living, but there's just, you know, there, there aren't the jobs. They don't exist or the yeah, money well, doesn't. True North would hire you, but I, I, I would have, I would have loved to go to True North, but the thing is they wanted, they wanted me to move out there and I just wasn't ready to do that, but I, I would have loved to have gone there. Absolutely. Um, here's a couple of questions that were sent in, in advance. And the first one is from. Esther, and she asks, I have my client who had cancer is now on a low dose of medication and was told she can't eat flax seeds because it would interfere with her medication. And what should she eat and not eat to keep it from coming back? You have done talks about cancer and you said today you're not even a, a big fan of flax seed anyway. No, I think I don't, I don't kind of get what all the fuss is about flax. It's got all, because also you, I'll, just to let you know where I'm coming from. My background is as a wrestler. And if I hadn't got injured, I would be a wrestling coach right now <laughs> instead of a doctor. And to me, it just seems insane. I think the whole world's gone crazy. It's like, why should a man seek out estrogenic fat? Okay. I mean, you tell me, do you want to eat this food? It's got lots of estrogenic fat. I'd go, excuse me. Okay. The guys that hang around with the tough guys. Okay. The wrestlers. Why would I want to eat estrogenic fat? I mean, and the same thing with soy is estrogenic fat. It has zero appeal to me. I mean, if somebody showed me a whole bunch of legitimate studies that there was some benefit to it, I would maybe consider it, but I, I don't even get it. You know what I mean? And I see there's just like this big push on, on other foods like that. So that's why I'm not interested in flax. I've heard it's high fiber. And the other thing is too, think about it. It's um it's a bit of a PUFA. It is a PUFA. You know, it's got more than two double bonds. So that means it's going to tend to lipid peroxidation. They always talk about these PUFAs. You have to put them in a radial pay container, keep them in the fridge. Well, how fast are they going to undergo lipid peroxidation as soon as they, you know, go into your mouth? You know, you, you heat things up to 98.6 degrees. And then are you going to get all these side products? At least if you're dealing with the plant fats, you know, the 18 carbon plant fats, that's not so bad. But when you start talking about the longer chain ones with more double bonds, you know, EPA and DHA, five, six double bonds. I don't know. I haven't studied it. Just to me, it sounds like, why would I risk all this lipid peroxidation, obesity, insulin resistance when I don't need it? Um, so it just doesn't appeal to me. I don't even, I don't even, and I know what people might say, well, you need omega threes to fluidize the cell membranes in your brain. And, you know, my first thought will be, well, gee, you got your brain cells from childhood. Okay. We can remember things that happened when we were a little kid. Why? Because our brain cells don't turn over that fast. Okay. They sit there for our entire life, but people could counter that argument. They go, yes, it's true. Your big neurons tend to be in place ever since you were a baby. However, there's also a lot of ongoing synaptogenesis, you know, new connections formed every time you learn something and maybe the omega-3 would help for that. Maybe, but I just don't, it doesn't seem to be a problem. And I can also tell you my cognitive abilities improved uh, once I went vegan. Okay. They were always good, but I mean, they, they, they improved when I went vegan, my clarity of thought, you know, I'm 60 years old. I can easily read for 10 hours straight. 
you know, I, I'm strong in the weight room. I used to set of squats pretty easily, 50 reps with 165 pounds. And what I'm trying to say is, I don't have a problem. Why would I seek out something when there isn't a problem there? And I feel so much better than I did in my 30s when I was eating sort of um, what you would call like a healthy version of the Mediterranean diet. I was fat and I got sick and I was kind of freaked out by it. I couldn't, I couldn't resolve it on my own willpower, which really surprised me. And then I went and started reading all the nutrition literature. That's how I got down this path. Plus my parents were sick and all that. Well, you know, and I don't want to ever say anything about any other doctor, especially when they have a regular show on my channel, like Dr. Brooke Goldner, who we love. Many people do her protocol that has a half a cup of flax seeds in smoothies, and they are reversing their autoimmune disease. Well, if it's working for them, I think that's great. And like I said, to a lot of people, they always tell me, you know, they don't want me to hear what I have to say. And, then, and so I'm saying, look, I give you my opinion. You know, that's where I'm coming from. I don't have any autoimmune diseases. So I'm I'm not worried about that that context of it. I'm I'm glad that other people are getting good results. For me, what I'm doing is working, and you know it's backed up by my studies. Right. Well, you know, you, the diet you recommended, low in fat, is is pretty much. I, th I think we're pretty much on the same diet, but I think that's hard for a lot of people. You know, to not have not necessarily the oil, but the you know the nuts and the seeds that they. Yeah, they I, I hear all that, but here's my attitude. You know, I did a surgical internship. And I'd go around consenting all the patients. Okay, sir, you're scheduled for a craniotomy. Oh, sure, I'll sign right here. You're scheduled for open heart surgery. Oh, sure, I'll sign right here, okay? You're scheduled for chemotherapy. Oh, sure, I'll sign right here. And I'm like, I was amazed at how fast they'd signed. You know, you could say, well, they already talked to their doctor or what, but I'm just telling you, there was very little hesitancy, all right? And then you say to a person, well, you're gonna have to go low-fat vegan. Oh, I don't know if I could do that. I'm not ready for that. And I'm like, what you don't understand is, if you don't go low fat vegan, like William Roberts said, he said, what percentage of herbivores develop atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease if you feed them a high fat diet? They all do. They all do. We're, you know, we got flat teeth like a herbivore, our jaw goes side to side like a herbivore. We're designed to eat these low fat plant based diets. Um, and so if you don't, you're basically screwed. I mean, all I'd see every day in front of every Western hospital is a line of fat, diabetic, hypertensive. They never get better. They just crash and burn. And they, all their money's taken away from them. They're prematurely demented. It's sad. And it's sort of like, you have a chance to avoid this. So the attitude, instead of whining like an idiot saying, oh, I don't know if I really want to do that. I believe in everything in moderation, like a typical dummy. My attitude is, thank God, there's something I could do. I'm not inevitably screwed. I don't have to be fat, sick, and stupid like all these other people. Thank God there's something that works. This is so wonderful. That's how I felt. I was so happy. You know, I studied for so many years. I was so lonely for so many years, studying all the time by myself. I didn't know anybody at my college and my med school is like in a bad neighborhood. So there were no social events. All right. And so I, I wanted to become a great doctor. And then I'm like, crap, there really isn't much we can do. At least I'm making some money, you know? And um, then when I learned all this nutritional stuff, when I was trying to study it for myself and for my parents being sick, I'm like, wow, here's where all the answers are. Nutrition, epidemiology, and toxicology. This is great. At first, I was all happy. I go, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to now. I know how to cure all these patients. Everybody's going to be so happy. They're going to they're going to like me. It's they're going to invite me around to speak. They're going to want to talk to me. And then what ends up happening is like, shut up, shut up. And also, why am I speaking here? Because the conventional medicine world it rejects this knowledge. It doesn't want it because it doesn't know how to make money off of it. So, but this is where the powerful knowledge is. And again, my attitude is. Thank God there's something one can do. You don't have to be like all these sick people. They're very sad and pathetic and you don't want to end up like that. And this is your, this is the way you have the best odds to avoid it. Great. Well, I mean, I think it'd be great if you could at some point go into lifestyle medicine. I think, I don't, I don't think that people necessarily disagree with what is said, but I think it's hard for people to do, like you say, in general, that's what I've noticed. Yeah. One, la one last thing I would say too is, a lot of people, they compare themselves to their cousin. They go, well, at least I'm not as fat as my cousin. They have what I would call low standards, okay? I have high standards. I want to be the best I can be. I want to be the best doctor in the world. I want to be as fit as I can be. I want to be as healthy as I can be. And so I'm always pushing it. What's the best I could do? How could I improve this? And I think if you do that, you'll end up as, as good as you can do versus if you just have this attitude, well, I'm not as fat as, you know, like I said, my relatives, or I'm not as fat as my coworkers or something. If you got standards like that, you'll you'll sort of, you know, be half ass at everything. You'll never reach your potential and you'll probably end up a little bit better than your cousin or whatever, but not much. So I wouldn't go down that path. Thank you. We had a question that was sent in in advance from 
Lemitris, I hope I said your name right. What is your view on silicone cookware, ice trays, and other silicone items that may touch our food? Um, I don't know. I don't know anything about eating off silicone, but I do know there is such a thing as silicone breast implant leak and that silicone in the body, when it gets free, it can induce autoimmune disease. So I don't, I don't see any reason to seek it out. Yeah. Dr. Rogers, thank you so much. I, 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 while you were talking, I, I did, I took, I took a moment to send you an email, something, some research that was sent to me, and I'd love for you to look at it. It was an email that Dr. McDougall and many other doctors were copied on about omega threes, and I don't know if that would be a topic that maybe you'd want to come back and discuss. Oh, something. I could talk on that. I know a lot more about it too. And if you know, people say theoretically we evolved, you know, with other primates or chimps are our nearest common ancestor. I'm not completely certain of that, but I'll say to myself, okay, a chimp, all right. First of all, um, chimps, none of them eat fish, okay? They're all plant-based, like almost vegetarians, the, the gorillas in particular. The chimps are a little controversial. I know they'll eat, bono they'll, they'll eat monkeys, Colobus monkeys, okay? But I also don't think we're as related to chimps as people say. They say, oh, your DNA is only about one or 2% different. That's BS. We have tons of regulatory encoding DNA. And I can also tell you, if I'm walking down a hallway and I see a woman, I can't help it. All men do this, even though we don't talk about it. You always think immediately, would I sleep with her? Yes or no? You don't even think about it. It's subconscious, okay? And what I'm trying to say is when you see a chimp, you don't say to yourself what I sleep with. You say, run for your life, okay? It, and what I'm trying to say is two twin girls, they look, they're 5% different from each other, the twin sisters, okay? A chip ain't 5% difference. It's totally different than us. Uh, okay, but I was making the argument that if theoretically, if we evolved in a hot climate, okay, you don't need omega-3s. The cold water fish needs omega-3s so it doesn't freeze to death. But now we're getting into a whole other subject. So I, yeah, I would be happy to talk about that in the future sometime. Great. Dr. Rogers, thank you so much. Thanks. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time for Dr. Sunil Pai healing spices. Thanks everyone for watching.